Hey guys, welcome out to Revolution this morning. Um, well, it's morning here in Australia. I'm not sure what time it is where you are. But um, we're going to go through, um, just basically we're going to have an open mic, open topics, and we're going to look at TR issues. And so um, there's been quite a lot going on. I just recently had a debate with CJ Cox and um, I was reviewing um, a, a debate between Will Kinney and Francis Turretin. Um, I'm supposing that's Turretin fan, uh, James White's friend. Um, I've had a little bit of a discussion with him on Revelation 16.5 on his Facebook. Um, interesting guy, but um, I sort of find some of these guys just have this presupposition where the critical text is correct and um, no matter what you say, they, they, or no matter how much you disprove what they're saying, they're not really interested in, um, in coming to the party with even just acknowledging that what you've said is, is factual and true and th that they should change their opinion according to that. And so, um, Will did have a fair bit of contact with me before the debate, um, just about Revelation 16.5. And I guess in a way, I, I can sympathise with people who don't understand my view on Revelation 16.5 because it is um, it is a complex topic, but it's once you understand it, it's it's so basic. It's so basic. And um, I know that people have been following me uh, for quite a while. Usually it's because I wrote a book on it. And it's one of those things where whatever's right in front of your face, it's, it's usually coming out of your mouth. And and so um, I've described, you know, the Revelation 16.5 thing over and over and over uh, quite a lot of times. And, you know, some people have got it um, straight away. Other people, like, say, for example, um, with uh, Jeff Riddle, uh, a few years back, he did quite a lot of uh, blog posts on Revelation 16.5. I think James White was continually bringing it up because of what I was doing. And so um, so Jeff was going to go through and um, sort of critique what I was saying about it. And I sort of pointed to the KJV Today article um and said I got I got information from there, but I really shouldn't have done that because it was basically one line in the KJV Today article that showed me um, the key to what it was, and it actually wasn't even that. It was um, I I looked at that previously that it was related to the name Jehovah, and I dismissed it. I thought that's a stretch. Why would this one obscure verse be related to the name of Jehovah and blah blah blah? But it was actually in studying the name of Jehovah um, that I realized it was the one who was and is and shall be. I'm like, well, that's the reading of Revelation 16.5. That's weird. And so that um, that got me thinking. And then um, studying through the name, then studying from that verse back uh, into annotations and things like that. That's what got me there. And so, um, but it was sort of a bit of a shame because then uh, Jeff Riddle got caught up in the weeds of the KJV Today website and a whole bunch of other stuff that I really wasn't saying. And it was sort of, it sort of fizzed out because it is quite a complex topic and there's quite a lot to be said on it. And so uh, someone challenged me, it was Michael Borowski. So he just recently did a, uh, a debate with um, a guy called Tanner, I think it was. Um, and so Tanner seems like an IFB sort of guy. Um, and listening to his argumentation, you know, he just basically has the, the presupposition, presupposition that King James is always correct, which isn't really a bad presup. But it's like when you're doing a debate, it's pretty uninteresting. It's sort of like, well, what about this reading? It's like, well, it's in the King James, so it's correct. And it's just, it doesn't really make for much interaction. Um, explaining, you know, sort of how it got in there or why it's a better reading or, or you know, how it's in other other places or whatever. You know, usually that makes for a good debate. But, um, but you know, he seems like a, a young guy and um, there were a few um, issues there that he brought up that were, that were good. Um, 
and so anyway, I'm going to be debating Michael Borowski probably after August uh, on Revelation 16.5 because I, I sort of put it out there and said, no one wants to debate me on Revelation 16.5. And he said, I will. And I thought, beauty, because I know that what he says about it is basically what James White says about it too. So hopefully he'll go through between now and then and study the issue because that will make for a more interesting debate. But if not, um, I'll just share. It'll just be a monologue. I'll just share what I know and whatever he brings up, which will be from you know James White and um, probably you know Stephen Boyce debate or something like that. Um, I'll easily be able to refute that, but then I'll be able to sort of spread the understanding of um, Revelation 16.5 and how uh, that is a correct reading. And so what am I going to go through today? Well, um, I really have nothing planned. Um, I just sort of just leave it absolutely open to anything. Maybe, um, or what I'll do first is I'll put up the, the link in so StreamYard. It's a banner. Oops, wrong one. Hide. <laughs> That's from last time. I've got to override that. Go. Ooh, scroll at the bottom of the screen. Why not? There we go. And maybe I'll just type in um, like join live or something. Don't know how this works. Um, oops. Sure. If you don't know how this works, basically, if you just type type in streamyard.com, go to their website, um, and then just type in uh, those letters there. And so, um, what I'll do is I'll go to YouTube and I'll just post it in the comments there. Oops post it in the comments there so that way you can just click on the link and you're right there okay all right so all right we got a comment that's me <laughs> okay so it's not really um warmed up yet so we've got a few people watching we've got a few people in the tr academy and uh mm -hmm. some people in um youtube so what am i going to talk about well uh maybe i should um throw my uh thing up on the share screen i'll just keep that there i'll go to share screen um Okay, here we go. We can share that. Okay, so this is my website, <clears throat> texasreceptors.com. And I've noticed there's been a few people chatting about Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. But it was quite interesting. I had a bit of a revelation last night while reading Revelation that um, the Theos, um, God, which is in the majority of manuscripts. This is one of those places, those rare places where the majority text doesn't agree with the TR. I know a lot of people sort of, they really worry about that. And I, I think a lot of places um, in, uh, or, or a lot of, um, a lot of the mindset in uh, among uh, TR advocates is that we are basically a majority text group, but we just sort of go a little bit too far. And so a lot of people think that by defaulting to the majority text, it's a safe thing to do. Um, but to me, it's almost like, it's like, um, yeah, it's good. It's like doing a, a whole bunch of work on, you know, you, you want to get a PhD, you want a doctorate. And so you've done a bunch of work, but you didn't run it through spell check. You know what I mean? And so a, even a lot of the readings in the 1904 Greek Bible, um, 
match with the TR because they realise there's grammatical issues if you just go with a majority Byzantine text. Sorry, I'm just trying to... My ear keeps clicking there. That's a bit better. Um, and so... So, yeah, so this is one of those uh, rare places where um, the word theos, hotheos, which is the god, um, appears in the majority text. And so the critical texts also run with it because of Codex Sinaiticus. And so what I was doing last night is I just looked at the Complutensian polyglot. And so uh, the 1514 Complutensian polyglot has hokurios hotheos here. And so... Um, I'll just enlarge that a little bit more. Hokurios Hotheos. Um, here we have Complutensi Polyglot. I'll show you the picture. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, Legi Curios Hotheos. So you can clearly see the Theos here. Okay, so um, that is not in the reading of Erasmus. So if we go down to Erasmus's text, um, we can clearly see it just has um, Hokurios and then uh, Hoen Kaiho Un Kaiho Echomenos, which means the one who was and is and is to come, Hoped Tokrator. Um, the Almighty. So it, this is pretty much what Scrivener has um, as well. So I'm just reading through some comments that have popped up here. There's one, Ya Rescues, greetings. Facebook user, can you please restate what the issue is with Revelation 16.5? Okay, I'll do that. Because it does relate to Revelation 1.8 as well. Okay, so maybe what I'll do, I'll just... Um, I've got so many pages open here, but I will just jump to Revelation 16.5 on my website. So I've written a book about this as well. So I might see if I've got that on my um, on my hard drive here. Revel. but I can also always plug a hard drive in and grab it. But um, I might be able to just do it online here. So if I go down to Revelation chapter 16 here, and verse 5. And so you just click on the little number. It will take you to the just the verse. <clears throat> okay, so... Up the top, I've got a link to my book so you can buy it in print form. But if you do want that book, I can uh, email it to you. If you just, um, you know, send me your email. My email is A-U-S-C-L-I-X, ausclicks at gmail.com. It's A-U-S-C-L-I-X. If you contact me, I'll send you a copy, sort of like a PDF or maybe a Word doc of the book for free. And so um, what is the issue? Okay, I'll try to find um, where this issue is just cleared up. Sometimes it's actually by looking at the English, because sometimes I can be so, how I can have so much detail that it's just like a bunch of trees and you can't really see the whole forest, <laughs> if you know what I'm saying. So, um all right so i'll go down to um i'll go down to we'll start with the english first okay so the english bibles um so we have wycliffe uh just art thou lord that art so that is a present tense and that were, that's the past tense, holy. Okay, so we see the holy there. Um, Tyndale, he has, um, which art and wast, thou art righteous and holy. Okay, so it's, it's sort of, it's, it's different to what the um, text says in the KJV. 
1535 edition of Coverdale. Um, uh, Lord, notice it's in capitals there. So he's relating that to Jehovah, uh, which art and wast thou art righteous and holy. So he's a very similar um, copy from Tyndale. Um, Lord, which art and wast thou art righteous and holy. So usually it just has holy, but the righteous is usually after that, saying you have righteous judgment sort of thing. Um, but they've sort of mixed it up a little bit there. Um, this is, I think, the Matthew, yeah, Matthew's Bible and Tyndale Bible sort of mixed together. Um, Lord, which art and wast thou art righteous and holy. Okay, so very similar. 1557 um, Geneva Bible. Actually, that says a 1560 there, but that doesn't look like it. Um, Lord, uh, thou art just, which art and which wast and holy. So that is very close to the Greek there. And so it says, uh, you know, Lord, as curios, um, thou art just, um, or thou art just is usually afterwards, but it has which art, so you are, and which was wast or you know um in the past and holy so that's pretty much what the manuscripts say and holy it's um k um uh, uh somenos uh sorry k osios sorry for holy the bishop's bible lord so we have the curios which art and wast Thou art righteous and holy. So he sort of mixed it up a little bit there again. So what we see with the clearest and the best translation ever, um, thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shalt be, because thou hast judged thus. So how come the holy has been changed into shalt be? Um, if we look at any other Bible... I'll just go to Revelation 16.5 on, say, Bible Hub. <clears throat> Let's look at this issue. Um, NIV, you are just in these judgments, O Holy One, you who are and who were. So you notice it's got the present tense and the past tense, but there's no future tense of shall be. But it's got this holy one there. Okay. Um, we won't bother with new living at the moment. Uh, ESV, um, just are you a holy one who is and who was. Notice there's no shall be, but it does have a holy one. Okay. Um, so even the New King James has you are righteous, O Lord, the one. So it sort of adds those words, the one, where um, it doesn't have that in the King James. So they've sort of adopted that from the NIV, I guess, or NASB, because um, the King James clearly says, O Lord, which art the present and wast the past and shall be the future. Okay, so we have those three tenses there. Um, so I think you get my drift. You know, So I'm just basically going through and saying, all the Bibles um, before the King James just had um, the present and the past. All the all the modern Bibles just have the present and the past. So what's going on here? Why is this happening? Um, I might grab my... Yeah, I might grab my hard drive because I do have a copy of this online. But the problem is, it's um, actually I can jump onto my email and quickly download it. Uh, so, and so, um, yeah, so you can clearly see the issue there. I'll just download this. Sorry about my. Um, interaction being a bit jumpy here. Um, okay, here we go.
there we go. So this is my book. <clears throat> um, maybe I can make that a bit larger. I haven't used this format before. Google Docs, anyway. Um, da, da, da. Yeah. Might be full screen. Doesn't help. Okay, anyway, so while we're fiddling around with just trying just trying to do something simple like make a page larger. Explore. Oh my lord. Exit full screen. I mean they don't make these things user friendly, do they? Da, da, da. I've probably got a million comments like you fool just press this button but you're probably looking at it too this is the problem with with google um surely you can zoom in maybe just control and zoom there we go button is always a shortcut aha okay so revelation 16.5 bees's expansion of the rare Nomen Sacrum form of Jehovah and I am in the final Triadic Declaration. Now, what is that? Is that Chinese or what? And I've got this picture here because it is a complex, um, it is a complex thing. But as you can see, these these things are joined together. If you just follow the dots. If you go through, follow all the dots, you'll come out to a logical conclusion. And so uh, let's have a look down here. Now, this here, you'll be happy to know that this is the first time that this change appeared in print. So the first trace of a Somenos in Beza's reading is in Beza's own handwritten notes in his 1565 edition on page 647 in preparation for the third edition of his 1582. So in his 1582, um, he, when he was um, going through his 1565, he wrote um, Ho Esomenos in the margin there, underlined Ho Ozios. Okay, so here we have, um, I know some of you guys probably won't see that, but I can't really zoom in any further. Um, unless i make that full screen that's better okay so we see um hosios here so the holy one so we have kurie um a ho un kai ho en kai ho ozios so the difference is he's changed ozios to ho esomenos here okay so it sounds pretty similar but they're very different words one means um and holy and the other one means um and it shall be or and will be it's the future so um i'll just move down here i haven't looked at this book for quite a long time when you do a big work you don't really want to go back over it so um one thing i will point you to and i'll just um close it down for a second I will point you to, um, we don't want a live video in, in the background, that'll take up all the bandwidth, but if you go to my videos, my channel, um, my videos, there's one called Jehovah, where I actually read through the first chapter of this. And it goes for, I think, just over an hour. I've got so many things open. I'm going to have to close down a few of them. But if we go to... Oh, I must have missed it. Maybe I did a live video with that one. I think I did live. Maybe I need to search it. Um, 
Wow. There it is. Um, Jehovah or Yahweh Jupiter. And so all I really do with this uh, video is um, I just read through the first chapter of the book that I'm showing you online here. So um, I'm not going to go through that today. Um, I'll actually skip over it and hopefully uh, you're the sort of person who would do um, some diligent homework and watch that video. So it goes for an hour and 20 minutes. And, you know, if you just put me on 1.5 speed or 1.25, you, sh you should be able to rip through that in about an hour. Okay, so I'm going to shut some of these down because I've got so many things open. Okay, yeah. Okay, so that saves me from going through the first part of it, but I can summarize it and I can stop at some of the pictures. Okay, so this is the main issue, and this is sort of how it appears in James White's book. The KJV has and shall be, and the NASB has O Holy One. Okay, so why is this? Uh, and James White's often pointed this out as, Revelation 16.5 has zero Greek evidence for this. So this is usually um, what's said. Where in my book, I prove that we have 100% Greek evidence for this. So I know my headphones are still cracking a little bit there. Right on my jaw. Okay, so I've got a few things where he says stuff in the King James Only controversy. Um... I'll just, I think that's just an intro. I'll sort of stop on the pictures. Okay, so we've got the Tetragrammaton. So why do I go to Jehovah? Simply put, because the one who was and art and shall be, it's the past, the present, and the future. Um, and Jehovah, many people think it's in the name Yahweh. Um, Jehovah actually comes from Hava. Okay, so it means shall be, may be, or will occur. So hover is quite, it's quite a common word in Hebrew. And so um, if we zip down here, we can see that say a, a name like Isaac, it means it's sark here in the Hebrew. It means to laugh. But if we put a yod in front of it, it's I suck. Okay, so that's quite simple. Um, so we have Jehovah, we have hover or hover to be or to exist, and we have Yehovah. Uh, yeah, um, that becomes a name. And so we see here, you know, Jacob, the supplanter, you just put a yod in front of it, um, etc. cetera. So uh, sometimes common nouns are formed in the same manner. So we see these names are formulated like this. So Yehovah comes from Hava. So it's very simple. And so uh, this is the, in the 1814 elements of Hebrew grammar. This is back in the day when people actually knew Hebrew, not just, you know, they come out of college and go, oh, I'm going to make a career. And so they just copy and paste stuff and don't really know what they're talking about, like people like Michael Heiser. Um, so knowing uh, that Jehovah comes from Hava, what does it mean to be or to exist? So if God was saying he exists, he would say, I am. So the name I am am and the name jehovah are linked okay so it's good to understand this and, and this was sort of like a revelation to me so um i was very happy to sort of go through um all this stuff um yeah and so james white he said um i said the holy is clearly a nominous sacra art and wast and shall be is the expansion of the i am and of hova in jehovah so um, I'm, I was explaining this to James White and um, clearly this basically equals Jehovah. Now in the temple, when the priest said Jehovah, um, w when someone said Jehovah, everyone else would say, um, which art and wast and shall be, you know, or basically I'll just keep it in modern English, you know, who was and is and shall be you know, the past, the present, and the future, because it can get confusing because you have the, the present and then the past and the future in this one. And so um, James White says, I've scrolled back through your comments 
uh, as I truly find it impossible to defend the TR reading of Revelation 16.5 consistently. So um, please prove Osios is a nomina sacra. Um, there is no hover in Yehovah, uh, which should be pronounced Yahweh. <laughs> so it's kind of funny. So what I do is I, if you go through my video, I go through where nomina sacra started. It started from the shortening of Jehovah in the names of biblical people. Jehoshaphat became Josephat. Jehoiakim became Joachim, Jehonanim became Jonanan, um, all that sort of stuff. And so the, the theophoric names. And we also have, you know, um, people like Davidson. In his conclusion, it's it's like we could, uh, moreover, not account for the abbrevi abbreviated forms um, prefixed to so many prop proper names unless we consider the vows of Jehovah originals. So he's saying that the that jehovah the reason we know it's jehovah because so many people are named after jehovah um we see jehoshaphat jehoshaphat it's not yah something it's jeho and these were shortened why this is the first form of nomina sacra so this is the the sort of trail that my book starts off in going through the name of god why we have nomina sacra uh, so it's invented basically to um, so that people aren't saying the name of Jehovah at the wrong place or the wrong time, you know, and don't take the name of the Lord in vain. So I look into that concept. And here we have um, at the same time, Nehemiah um, Gordon, I think it is. He brought out this picture. I don't know much about him. I've, I've heard some people say he's off the wall and all this. I don't really know that much about him, but I thought this was a great thing because it was in Hebrew. So it clearly showed the same concept. Um, Yehoakaz, Yehoash, so it's got Yeho in it. And so, um, you know, how did these Yeho, Jeho um, get into all those Hebrew names? Perhaps they were named after someone. It's quite logical. And so uh, James White calls uh, God Yahweh. And then, you know, we've got all these different Yahweh, Yahweh, Yeho, you know, go through all that. Um, but White is emphatic with Yah. Way, yeah, wait, like he's studied it out. He knows the breathing of Yahweh. You know, it's like it's kind of funny. I, I know pastors who have followed James White who say that same thing. It's like, no, it's definitely Yahweh. And I'm like, okay, you, you were standing next to the high priest when he said that, were you? Um, so anyway, so I go through all that. I go through Bart Ehrman's argumentation on this. Um, Okay, let's just go down. So it's interesting to note, this is a good thing to know. In the King James, Jehovah is in all capitals, Lord. Jehovah is God in all capitals. Adonai is Lord with a um, capital L and a small O-R-D. And Elohim is God uh, with a large G and a small O-D. Now, this is the basic pattern. There might be, you know, a, a small smattering where it's like you know elohim is translated as angels or his god just means rulers you know uh, or a ruler yes a singular or it can be plural um so i go through some of the names benjamin netanyahu and you know um Yahova, you know and how they're linked things like that and just how it appears pretty much everywhere and then i go through like john calvin and john calvin he talks about it how it's to be but then he talks about um in the book of Revelation, Ho'on, Kaho'en, Kaho'ekomenos, uh, the one uh, who is, who was, and is to come. And they link this to Jehovah. So basically, it's like an expansion of Jehovah. And so, um, so I won't go through too much more of that. Then I go through the whole thing about how um, Yahweh, where it comes from, and it's actually... Uh, Jove Pitta or Jove Pitta. They pronounce it, ex pronounce it in the ancient world, Yahweh. That's how they pronounced Jupiter. Yo Yahweh Pitta means um, Yahweh uh, father. Pitta is father. And so um, I go through the pronunciation of that, how Yahweh is exactly how they pronounce it in classical Latin. And then I go through Jesenius's, um Hebrew, and he says that's where he got the concept from. So the modern day concept of Yahweh comes from Jesenius, and he said he got it from the link to Jupiter. <laughs> it's like, it's just plain to see. And so, you know, I put 
put a bunch of Wikipedia stuff up there just so people can get a bit of background. Um, but yeah, so then I go through about the importance of, you know, having the name. I'm not a sacred namer, but I mean, you don't want to call God, um, you know, Jupiter. <laughs> it's, it's just bad, you know. And so the whole Yahweh concept, and then I go through Tregellus. Tregellus actually um, rebukes Jesenius, and in his brackets, he um, goes through and he shows that the name of Jehovah um, is the correct name, not Yahweh. <laughs> and But it just seems strange that you know, Tregellus, that's the one who the the guys from the Tyndale House, um, Greek New Testament, they follow him, but they won't follow him on this instance, you know, so... Um, so Jesenius afterwards thoroughly retracted the whole concept of, you know, being related to, um, Je uh, Jupiter. He retracted it later, but it's, it's be just become a popular thing. And James Wise, like, yeah, way, yeah, way. <laughs> it's just, it's just amazing. So anyway, then I go through a whole bunch of stuff sort of defending that, um, then in my book, I show that Jesus and Jehovah are the first and the last. So, you know, I'll go through a bunch of scriptures. Uh, the first and with the last, um, we see Isaiah uh, 44, I am the first and I am the last. And then we see Revelation, I am the first and the last. I'm here that liveth. So that's Jesus speaking. So we saw before it was Jehovah, now it's Jesus. So I just go through scriptures like that. The Alpha and the Omega, it relates to you know, the Almighty, and then later on it's Jesus speaking. So, um, you know, I changed not uh, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, forever. So I just go through, and basically this is a case for Jesus being um, having the same attributes as um, God the Father or the one who was named Jehovah in the Old Testament, proving that Jesus is Jehovah. And so, um Okay, so there's quite a lot on that. So then I go through the I am issue. Um, and so just to clear it up, basically my first video stops about when I was talking about the Jupiter thing. And so um, that's sort of when the first video stops. So that'll take you to there. If you want to read on from there and go through all this other stuff, um, I haven't done all this yet or I haven't, I haven't put it onto video. This is probably the, the first time. So, um, aya, asha, aya, uh, I am that I am in Exodus 3.14. Um, so we've seen that Jehovah and Hava, or to be or um, come to pass, are connected. Okay, so we, we see that. So aya, asha, aya, um, it's interesting um, that Miles covered our Bible has um, God said unto Moses, I will be what I will be. So, um Will and shall are very, very closely linked. And so um, you know, I shall be what I shall be. So he's, he's talking about in the future tense there where some have the past. Some say I was that I was. Some say I am I am who I am. Others say I will be what I will be. I shall be. And so it's quite interesting to go through the I am statements. And um, like covered as I will be is equivalent of Beza's esomenos. It's, so if you were to um, translate that. Uh, and shall be, will be in the King James Version of Revelation 16.5. Um, so while we've seen that shall be, will be, is clearly part of a sacred name of Jehovah, so it's the expansion of the past, present, and future, um, it's also part of the, the great I am. Um, the word Aya is used 43 places in the Hebrew Bible, where it can be often translated as I will be, such as the case for the first occurrence in Genesis um, 26 3 and its final occurrence in Zechariah and so I've got both of them there you know I will be with thee uh, I will be their God you know so it's ba a basic um, common uh, term in Hebrew okay so I'll sort of skip through a bit of that um, this is very fascinating this part here this uh, the more that I studied this, uh, I really wish that I had the time to study this further because I've written the book and there's probably twice as much information that I have scattered around the internet and on pieces of paper and just in my mind of even other verses, like I was looking at Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. And so um, 
that that has the triadic declaration in it. So the triadic declaration, um, let me just explain that first. I should have explained this earlier. And most of you probably know this. You have um, you have it appearing twice in Revelation chapter one. The one uh, who was and is and is to come is very common. And that type of pattern appears four times. Twice in uh, chapter one, in chapter four, verse eight, it appears with the um, hundred. Uh, sorry, the, with the twenty-four elders, they say that holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Um, there's a few songs written on that, and then you have uh, Revelation chapter eleven, verse seventeen, with um, the same thing. But then you have the the fifth appearance of it is in Revelation sixteen five. So. Let's just look at this. It says, um, someone I, which re replaced the words I am with will be, da, da, da. Okay, so Victor P. Hamilton suggests some lit legitimate translations. I am who I am, okay? I am who I was. So I am who I was in the past. I am who I shall be in the future. I was who I am. <laughs> I was who I was. I was who I shall be. I shall be who I am. I shall be who I was. I shall be who I shall be. And these are legitimate translations of I am. So I think you can see this whole connection between I am, shall, um, you know, shall be, um, Hava, the, 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 you know, the name of Jehovah, the etymology of Jehovah being Hava, to be. I think you can clearly see that. Um, you know, some Jewish commentaries on I am. I am he who is and who will be. Uh, Targum, pseudo Jonathan. Um, I am now what I always was and always will be. Uh, Midrash, Rabbi. So there's quite a lot of that. So I won't um, bore you with any more of that. Um, the London Polyglot um, of uh, 1657 has a Latin paraphrase and just has Eternus. The eternal. So it's translated as, uh, he said to him, the eternal who does not pass away. Um, so we're starting to see that, okay, the one who was and is and is to come can be just translated as I am, if God's saying it in the first person. But it also can just be, I am can be translated as eternal, eternity. Because you've got the past, present and the future. This just opens up. It's like um, there's so many sides to this. It's it's quite, it's very fascinating. I, I find it really fascinating. Um, so we have uh, who is, uh, who is not passed and will not pass away because he is the first and the last. So these are all, um, you know, I'm just basically building a case with some Jewish writings here. Uh, Jewish Bible translations, I am that I am. Um, and then we have, this translation from Aquila and Theodosian, it has I shall be as I shall be. Quite interesting for the I am. So that's the exact reading, you know, the King, I shall be, you know, or shall be. Um, the Anchor Bible series, they had this one and it has I will be who I will be. So some of these I don't agree with necessarily on their translational methodology, but it's showing you that people, uh, like I was showing you with that whole list of, you know, I, I'll just jump back up here because I really, I really love having this type of concept. I am who I am. I am who I was. I am who I shall be. I was who I was. All of those things, they are legitimate translations of I am. And so it just shows you the eternality of that whole concept of I am. It's so powerful. That's why when Jesus was in the garden and they said, you know, um, that they said something, the soldier said something to him. He said, I am. It says I am, and the he in King James is in italics, but it basically said I am, and they fell backwards. And I'm not saying it's a slain in the spirit or anything stupid like that. I'm saying these people were like, they're, they're just soldiers. They've probably got their own opinions like, man, Jesus healed my uncle. You know, of course he's God, you know, and he's like, I am. And they're just like falling backwards. This is a this is one of the most powerful statements in the whole New Testament. So this, um, so this is a powerful thing that I shall be, 
Uh, that's what I discovered. I'm thinking, oh, Revelation 16.5, it's just some obscure little verse in Revelation. Who really cares about it? And I'm thinking, okay, well, I'll go through all the weeds. And I discovered, hang on, this has the most holy name of God. This is like an I am statement in the book of John or something. This is powerful. And people like Beza knew this. They understood that this was very important. Um, <clears throat> so my summary here is from the above, it's clear the Jewish Bible translation from many sources translate Exodus 3.14 as shall be or will be, which is the exact way Beza has it in Revelation 16.5. Um, this link will become more apparent in latter chapters. Um when we look at the external evidence for Revelation 16.5 and the church writings, etc., So I'm building a case, okay? So I'm not saying, because a lot of people try to corner me on that and say, is that your only case? Like Stephen Boyce in our debate, he's like, oh, you're just talking about the, it's because it's in the Ethiopic. That's why you're saying it's in there. And I'm like, not really. I just, it's in there too, you know, sort of thing. And what I've discovered is the... Because this is the most holy name of God in the entire New Testament, that's why they've written holy over it. Now, you think of the way, um, or I'm sort of getting ahead of myself because I've got a, a sort of layer platform and then launch from there. So then I go through just some Bible versions that I may agree with or disagree with, but I, have, I am that I am, I will be who I will be, I am the one who always is, I am. Uh, it's quite interesting. So I've just got a whole bunch. The Amplified Bible, I am who I am and what I am, and I will be what I will be. <laughs> it's quite a quite a mouthful for the I am. Uh, I am the eternal God, the Lord, I am. Um, I am who I am, I am. So some of them are just um, re repeats. But you get the idea, the past, the present, and the future. Um, okay, yeah. So then we start going into the I am of the New Testament. Before Abraham was, I am. Very powerful statement. Jesus clearly saying that he is God. He is Jehovah. You're standing in front of God manifest in the flesh. Um yeah, so then I note that I am he in italics, and these people who came to arrest him fell backwards. Uh, Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. The original Greek says ego emi, and so that's I am. So I am he, you know. So Jesus said, I'm the bread of life, I am the light of the world, I'm the door, good shepherd, etc. So what I've sort of done with this, I've I've done a lot of study in this, which I didn't need to put all this in here for my case, but it's like that you just get on these trails and there's so much rich stuff in the Bible that you just feel like anyone reading through this, they would want to know this information. It's like, That's what I feel like anyway. Uh, so Jay Green, in his uh, literal translation, I've got the big one there. Um in translating the Greek words for I am, in certain places we have capitalized these words, I am. Um, it is our firm conviction that in these cases, Jesus is identifying himself as Jehovah. So he understood the link between I am and Jehovah. Okay. So I'm just, tr in this, what I'm trying to do is appeal, because I wrote this for James White originally, and then he, I handed it to him. He refused to take it. So then I just sort of expanded it a little bit and printed it. A, a guy wanted to print it, and so I said, yeah, go for it. Um, and so I was sort of thinking in the eyes of James White, okay, well, Jay Green, he's seen the link between I am and Jehovah. Of course, you know, James White will look at another scholar of that caliber who's done a, a you know, interlinear, you know, even, and he's not a, a TR, KJV only guy. He's sort of a majority text bit, bit, you know, he doesn't think the commas really, you know, he'll respect him because he hates the comma sort of thing. And it's like, so that's why I'm quoting all this stuff. Um, so the quotation of Green sums up our first chapter nicely. Jehovah is the I am. Jehovah is Jesus. Jesus is Jehovah. Jesus is the I am. The significance of this link to Revelation 16.5 will become more apparent in the next chapter as we examine how Jehovah translated in Greek as Kyrios becomes a key noun 
mentioned for triggering the pronouncement of the Tridic Declaration by heavenly beings. Now that sounds like a Michael Heiser thing, but it's it's um, a lot clearer than you think. Okay, so um, the Lord, Jehovah, um, this is my name forever. Okay, so it's just a little bit of a saying there. Okay, so these are the triadic declarations. Okay, so we're going to go through what I mentioned before, how it appears five times in the book of Revelation. Okay, so. Revelation 1, 4 and 5. <clears throat> So we just had a comment by Flame on YouTube. Yeah, I've, I mean, I've got so many books planned. It's just a matter of getting time to do it. And um, I would really love to write a book against um, this one, King James Only Controversy. This is this has got 10 errors on each page. <laughs> it's, And as this book that I'm reading at the moment is in response to his five pages on Revelation 16.5 here. And I show that James White knew nothing about this passage. He knew absolutely nothing. And that's why he refuses to read it. He just demonizes me on his channel. He won't debate me. He won't do, like, you know, he did a whole program on something I tweeted, but he won't, you know, go through my book in, in a logical fashion. But anyway, yeah, so I've, I've got books planned on Easter, books planned on um, the KJV only controversy. Um, but most of my stuff I've just found if, you know, rather than waiting for a book to come out and all that, I just put a lot of my stuff on the internet, on my webpage, uh, sorry, on my, on my website, um, texasreceptors.com. That way people can have access to the, this type of information immediately rather than, you know, some secret access or they have to pay 50 bucks or whatever for a, a book, um, where, bucks you know i don't know if you say that in america or 50 dollars for a book but um yeah eventually it would be great to get all this stuff and put it um into books and yeah, you know, this is a book that you can buy revelation 16.5 if you type my name in nick sayers revelation 16.5 it'll come up on amazon i'm not even sure how much it is um and so i think so far i've probably got about 200 bucks um over the last I think it was in 2018 or 2019 it got printed. So we've sold a few. It's probably about two a month. <laughs> and it would only be people who are really interested in this topic because I don't sort of branch off into, well, I do go into Jehovah and stuff like that. Anyway, let's keep going. But um, <clears throat> actually, I might just show that. Have you ever thought of writing a book that summarizes your argument? Yeah, I think as I... As I go along and as I do more debates and um, I'm explaining myself constantly all the time, I realize that I formulate my arguments a lot better and I clarify things. And I've found that with some things that I've, I've really nutted out in Christianity and I preach, if I'm constantly preaching the same thing over and over, eventually it just becomes um, something that is very palatable for people because I'm used to preaching in Papua New Guinea where people do speak English but usually it's a simplified type of English and so I have to give it to them in such a way that I, I know that they're going to understand it or else I'm wasting my time and so um, that's why with this I try to you know bring it in simple terms and um, I guess you know the book does get a bit complicated but um, hopefully I can bring it across in um, in simple terms. So let, Revelation 1, 4 and 5, which is and was and which is to come. Revelation 1, 8, which is and was and which is to come. Uh, Revelation 4, 8, which was and is and is to come. Um, Revelation eleven seventeen, which art and was and art to come. Revelation 16, 5, which art and was and shall be. Okay, so then I've got it in the Greek here. Uh, ho'on, kaho'en, kaho'ekomenos. Um, ho'on, kaho'en, kaho'ekomenos. Um, ho, 
en kaha un kaha e komanos um ho un kaha en kaha e komanos and then the last one ho un ho un kaha en kaha e somanos so you notice that last word is esomenos. Here we have ekomenos. So the, the previous four have ekomenos, which means is to come. The last one has esomenos, which means shall be. Okay, so pretty straightforward. So the phrase um, ho'un kaho en kaho ekomenos or esomenos is directly related to the eternal name of God. So we've seen that. In fact, Strong, in his Greek dictionary defi um, definitions, gives the entire triadic declaration its own Strong's number. And Spiros.Hades has two and a half pages on this one Strong's number. It's amazing. I, I just said this in passing to James White. He's like, if anyone goes to the Strong's Concordance, they obviously don't know what they're talking about. It's like, uh, no, I was just pointing out that other scholars, Spiros.Hades, can speak fluent Greek. James White can't. Um, they have this whole phrase as a name and with its own one number. This is very important to understand. It's a phrase combining, um, you know, all these other ones. Um, the one being and the one that was and the one coming, i.e. the eternal, um, as a divine epithet of Christ, uh, which art is, was, and which was is was and art is to come shalt be very interesting so that's a that's a strong any every strong has this definition um <clears throat> so take notice to what strong is showing here that the english triadic declaration which art is was and etc has shalt be in it in that name okay um so yeah then i've got the strongs listed there um so it's called a noun phrase so if i have if i'm talking about the boy who ran across the road um i might know his name so i might say well the boy who ran across the road stole my bike and the boy who ran across the road um you know kicked over my bin and the boy who ran across the road was wearing yellow shoes and the boy who ran across the road becomes a noun phrase i'm, I'm explaining something about someone and that becomes his name um so we see which is and was and which is to come which is and, and which was and which is to come which was and is and is to come which art and wast and art to come which art and wast and shall to be so we see the final ones a little bit different so we have the five tritic declarations in the book of revelation and we see the final one is a little bit different it's got shall be it's got a somina so we see it here in the greek um <clears throat> it can be seen a lot clearer and so um ho'un kaiho en kaiho ekomenos is basically the same pattern all the way through now every now and then you have you know which is and was and is to come or was and is and is to come and so it seems to actually change um after Whoops, I should really start editing that document. <laughs> uh, undo. There we go. That's better. Um, it seems to change yeah, after the Revelation 4 8. And I used to, you know, because I'm a, uh, I believe in the pre tribulation rapture. I know that upsets a lot of people, but I was like, oh, it's sort of you know, the one who was and is and is to come. Now it's the one who is and was and is to come. Maybe there's a difference there, but then it changes in uh, Revelation 11 7 back to the original so it's quite an interesting thing to to look into and to um develop a few theories about um okay so and what so what i do in this section is i prove that whenever the name or whenever it says curios okay um there's a notable link to the Tritic Declaration and Jehovah, okay? on So on examination, the Lord, or Kurios, is mentioned around these verse, verses, which could simply be back translated into Hebrew as Jehovah from John's perspective. So John was a Hebrew. Um, when they said, um, when an angel said, you know, Lord, it would have been saying Jehovah. 
Um, but then very close by you hear which, who was and is and is to come. And it's like, so this is what Theodore Beza pointed out. He said, whenever the name Jehovah appears, who was and is and is to come appears as well. It triggers this triadic declaration. And so it's a bit like you put the, the coin in and, and the prize comes out sort of thing. It's like, okay. Um, now, um, in the five instances of the Tritic Declaration, Jehovah is close by. Um, but the latter four are more distinct. And so what we see in chapter 1, verse 4 and 5 is John is saying it. I don't even think John knew what he was sort of saying. Like he was like, okay, the one who was, and he's because he heard it. He's writing the book of Revelation. Like I just had this revelation. I'm writing it to the seven churches. Uh, this is from him who is and was and is to come. Well, what a what a great name. What a you know. And but he probably would have known that. Hang on, this is related to the temple because they whenever they said Jehovah in the temple, they said who was and is and is to come. Or specifically, who was and is and shall be. Revelation 16.5 has that exact reading. That's the purest form of all the trite declarations. Because who was and is and is to come, it's like you're coming, but you're not existing. It shall be as you will exist. You know, so it's it's pure. Um, and so we shouldn't be surprised that there's no real name of Jehovah when John says it. But when we start getting into heavenly beings like Jesus and the, the 24 elders and angels and things like that, whenever they say it, they say Jehovah and straight away the, um, the tri declarations there. So, um, so I sort of make a bit of a case in my book that perhaps – you know, he's got, you know, from him, which is and was and is to come, the seven spirits and Jesus Christ. So he mentions the whole entire Trinity here. Um, it's quite interesting that the him is the one who was and is and is to come, which is talking about the father. It's, it's quite interesting because you sort of, you're going into this whole thing and, and trying to stay out of modalism. Um but then we see when Jesus says it, it says, and I, I actually just changed the name Lord to Jehovah here, just so people would get it, you know. Um, I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Jehovah, which is and was and is to come. So you can see that's triggered this expansion of the name of Jehovah. You, you can clearly see that. Um, then we see, you know, holy, 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 it's a Revelation 4, right? Holy, holy, holy. Jehovah, God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. So we can see that Jehovah has triggered this expansion of the name. And we see uh, in Revelation uh, eleven seventeen, 17, uh, saying, We give thanks to you, O Jehovah, God Almighty, which art and was and art to come. Um, so we see that there. And then we see Revelation 16, 5, O Jehovah, which art and was and shall be. So, um, Yeah, so what we see in chapter, um, in Revelation 16, 5, there's an echo in verse 7, which is quite interesting because this actually helps us in our verse. It says, And I heard the angel of the water say, Thou art righteous, O, you know, I've changed Lord to Jehovah here, O Jehovah, which art and wast and shalt be, because thou hast judged thus, okay? Um, for you have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. Um, Verse 7, and I heard another out of the altar say, even so Jehovah God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. So this angel has just said this. And then this other angel says uh, Jehovah. So it's, it's like it's the same thing. And I heard another out of the altar. So it's, it's not, this is the, at the same time. So you can imagine like in the temple, someone says Jehovah and someone says who was and is, is to come. And then, someone else says Jehovah who was and is is to come. It's interesting. The 24 elders, if you read their one, it says that they say it day and night. Um, and they rest not day and night saying, holy, holy, holy Jehovah. So this in heaven, you imagine this is like a record playing. Holy, holy, holy Lord God almighty, which was and is and is to come. Holy, holy, holy Lord God. Day and night. And so, 
Um, but you can see here why uh, um, Theodore Beza said when the name Jehovah appears, the triadic declaration is right there. Okay, so that's why I um, showed this in verse seven. It's basically the same event. It's not like it's a separate event down the road. Someone said Jehovah, and oh, the which art and was and shall be didn't occur. Um, it's right there as well. And so, um, okay. So what I did too, because people, you know, James White was saying, no, not everywhere where the word curios in the book of Revelation, where, wherever that appears, it doesn't trigger the, the name Jehovah. Of course, um, I'm speaking about, you know, beings from like Jesus, uh, you know, coming, any heavenly being, Jesus being God in the flesh, when he says it, it triggers it. When an angel says it, when the 24 elders say it. And so what I did is I, I went through um every everywhere uh lord appears and i'll have you know it's a clear link to jehovah you know lord which is and was and which is to come the almighty but then simp simply dialogue i was in the spirit on the lord's day it's not going to trigger a trad declaration from john or from his you know disciples or anything it's just he's just mentioning curios there but obviously it's just narrative, you know. So he's just saying, he's, he's explaining himself. Then you've got the clear link to Jehovah, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Um, and you can see here the Lord in this, is that, this similar thing, straight away, they're still saying this, thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. And so you see the Lord um, here, the Lord there, and the Tritic Declaration is um, among those sayings. Um, so then you have people just praying to God, and they cry with a loud voice, How long, O Lord, holy and true? So these are people on earth. They're going through, you know, they just started the seven year tribulation, pre tribulation raptures, just having that. Um, I won't go into that for you guys. I know some of you disagree with me, but you know, when the rapture happens, you know, don't I'll say, Look, see, I told you I was right, you know. It says, and they cry with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, you know. So they're they're not angelic beings or anything. They're just they're on earth, they're saying, Lord, you know, they're just using the word Lord. And so simply narrative and dialogue. Um, and it says Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. So it's just simply dialogue. So a clear link to Jehovah. Um, so then we see, you know, O Lord God Almighty, which art and was and art to come. So that's Revelation. So we see here is, uh, it's like a song, um, but it is, uh, Lord is mentioned and then the Tritic Declaration. Um, then we see simply uh, dialogue um, and narrative. Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from now. It's not like blessed are the dead who die in the Lord, who was and is and is to come from now on. You know, it's, it just wouldn't fit there. So when you go through, you can see that it does fit when an angel is saying it, when Jesus is saying it. Um, and so these guys sing a song of Moses. So it's obviously a song. I mean, you don't get an old song that you know and just change it. So say, like, uh, you wouldn't just get a Rolling Stones song and just in the middle of it, just add your own little bit. It's going to wreck it, you know. So obviously these guys, they are sticking to their song. Um, a clear link to Jehovah, O Lord, uh, which art and was and shall be. And then we see, we looked at before in the same narrative, it's got Lord there again. Um so then after that, it's not mentioned as, as a trite declaration. It's just, he is the Lord of Lords. So obviously, you're not going to say he's the Lord who was and is and is to come of Lords, who was and is and is to come. You know, it's just, it's a title. It's a name. They're just saying that. Um, utterly burned her with fire. For strong is the Lord God. So that's mentioned, but it's not Lord who was and is and is to come, you know, almighty, etc. So the rest of them are just narrative. And so, but I'd go right to the end just to sort of prove that. Um, okay, so I'll just skip down a bit. Okay, then we start getting into 
the Hutter Dodecaglot Bible, which is a 12 um, language Bible. So we just had a comment from Justin Orwell. I'll just throw this up. Um, sorry if this is off topic. Uh, who would you recommend reading um, if someone wanted to get into this debate? I know you and Doug Stalfa and James White and Stephen Boyce. Okay, so um yeah i've debated stephen boyce um on this to topic actually and um i've got a whole bunch of videos if you go to um my uh youtube archive you go, if you go to the playlist you can see where i've after the debate with stephen boyce i, I put up a bunch of videos where he was wrong and where he ref sort of refused to admit that he was wrong <laughs> like i don't mind chatting with people about all sorts of things but when you when they've given false information and they just double down it's like come on guys you're supposed to be apologists you're supposed to learn you know what, you know what i mean it's it's okay to say you're wrong don't be like the fonz um james white i've found he's absolutely toxic and he actually doesn't know that much and so what i would do if i were you i would um i know it it sounds like it's going down a level but you're actually going up a level if you would just go through some good websites I, I would read through my website um i would go through um the kjvtoday.net website um i would go through even will kinney's website um brand plucked and i would read through the information he has there and uh, a lot of the time he's he's a lot of the time he's just copied and pasted stuff you know that um you know people good argumentation that people had now i didn't agree with everything with those guys but um i would definitely point to those places for a good start and um if you want you know academic books most of these like if you just go through what i've spoken about today almost everyone in academia says that the name of god is yahweh which means jupiter i mean how wrong can they be it's like saying it's like me saying oh the name of jesus isn't jesus it's bababliam you have to say it with the bababliam it's like it's just the wrong name how how silly are these scholars and so that's you know james white these other guys it's like yeah d.a carson um because you mentioned him um i've got his book there you know the the king james uh you know plea for real realism or um or whatever that's titled as oh yeah here it is um oops you guys can't even see me there i forgot about that this one king james version debate a plea for realism da carson um so many mistakes in this you know um i would probably read through edward hills this is a bit dated now but it's way better than james white has um i would go to um, david cloud's website and read what he has um and yeah so that's where i would go if you go into the james white stevie boys um like i've sort of followed stephen boyce's stuff because uh like i like to give credit where credit's due i think he he's doing a better job than most on um you know issues of who authored matthew and who you know who authored um you know book of revelation etc um so i i would yeah there's not much that i would change with that type of material um but then he'll just turn around and delete the prick of bad ultra and say it's you know, it needs to be thrown into the bin um james white uh he does a lot of really good stuff against roman catholics um you know so that these guys you know they do have good things about them but when it comes to textual criticism um i would just steer away from these guys and there's another really good guy that i would get into as well called taylor de soto um uh jeff riddle definitely if you go to stylos or just type in jeffriddle.net and you'll get to his page. Read through his Word magazine issues. Most of them uh, are on YouTube or you can listen to them in audio. And if you go through his material, you'll be very um, schooled on uh, much of what's 
um, going through academia at the moment with the CBGM and um, things like that. And so whenever he's got an issue out, I usually listen to it. Sometimes I listen to his stuff over and over. Um, and I, I recommend people do that as well. If they find something good, go over it and over it and over it until you get it. Um, because, yeah, sometimes, um, you know, like, say, well, I was recently debating about Cherubim. And, um, you know, I explained myself, but the guy just didn't, sort of listened to what i was saying and he kept going on about it and then it was like you know an hour into the debate it, it seemed like the light went on and he was like oh you know he finally sort of listened to what i what i was sort of saying and so that and i you know i find myself doing that too i'll skim over things but it's like sometimes you you're better off just nailing something and so like jeff riddle stuff is is really good taylor de soto stuff really good and so, yeah, and a lot of this stuff isn't, you know, published out there, but it's it's free. It's on the internet. It's, it's way better. And so um, hopefully that helps. Uh, Hudson, um, uh, TD777 says, the text critic uh, narrative is that they only had a few manuscripts during the Reformation, but now we have more and better manuscripts um, that they did not have. And so, yeah, that's... Um, yeah, that's, that's a huge thing where it's like they're saying, oh, we've got all these better manuscripts now, but they can't even tell you what Erasmus had. They can't tell you what Erasmus looked at. They can't tell you what Theodore Beza had at Revelation 16.5 because later on we're going to see that he says that he had a manuscript. And for like hundreds of years, people didn't know that until Jeff Riddle basically retranslated the Latin. Larry Brigden, who's a, a Latin scholar for the Trinitarian Bible Society, he translated um retranslated the latin and jan kranz agreed that it was um he was saying that he had a, a, a manuscript but he sort of slipped on a banana Beza must have slipped on a banana peel and didn't know what he was talking about you know it's sort of because he's a critical text guy and um and also uh we see that um stephen boyce he had uh someone from the smithsonian tr um translate that from the latin and it clearly says that he had an ancient manuscript and so i'm just seeing it everywhere and so um no one knows what this manuscript was we're, we're sort of getting closer and closer to it but it's like um these people in munster they're not interested in finding that type of information out they're interested in defending b and aleph and so um the the embarrassment of riches all these manuscripts they th like just look at the last 12 verses of mark all the manuscripts, except for Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, they omit the last 12 verses of Mark. They go with those. The rest of the majority and all that, they throw it straight in the bin. So this embarrassment of riches is just straight in the bin, and we go with Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. So it just goes to show you they don't care about those other 5,000 manuscripts or whatever. They have no... It's just a bunch of numbers that they can bolster to say, look, we've we've checked everything, you know, and, but they can have checked everything, but they won't go with that. <laughs> that. That's the thing. It's like they've come to the wrong conclusion. It's sort of like, okay, well, we're going to do a survey of how many people think killing kittens is wrong, you know, and so you do a survey. It's like, well, 99.999% said that killing kittens is wrong, but we're going to kill them anyway, you know, it's like... <laughs> Okay, well, why have all that? Why have this apparatus full of stuff if you're just going to go with be an ally? You know, be honest. Uh, that's what I say to people like uh, James White, Dan Wallace. Um, so Flame YouTube said, can you give me an elevator pitch of why not Yahweh? I've never heard this stance. Um, yeah, so I was explaining that before, and I do have a video on that if you want to go to um, my channel and search for uh, Jehovah or Yahweh. So basically, um, it comes down to the theophoric names, people who are named after Jehovah. Jehoshaphat, Jehoiakim, Jehonan, they all have Jeho in their name. Uh, there's many other people who have Jeho after the name, so like even Benjamin Netanyahu. Yahoo is Jehovah, Yehovah. Um, Yahweh is an invention um, from Jusenius who said that the old name of Jupiter, which they called Yahweh Pitta, which means um, 
this basically the, a sky father um yahweh peter uh jupiter jupiter um he said that the name of god is related to that so Jacinius retracted that he was a hebrew scholar um Tregegels, he rebuked him for that and it's just become a popular thing um it's it's a bit like saying El, uh, what was it um the shekinah glory of god you know or something within charismatic circles it's like oh the shekinah glory came down people don't even know what they're saying like modern hebrews say the shekinah glory is a male and female um now there's probably more evidence for having that word actually you know because that's a modern hebrew definition to an older definition might just be you know um the the shekinah glory it's 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 a um it's a shininess and all this sort of stuff but when you're dealing with Yahweh, it's clearly from Jupiter. So the people that they're in church singing out, hey, Jupiter, we love you, Jupiter. And isn't it interesting that um, there was a time when uh, in, in the period between, you know, um, intertestamental period between Malachi and Matthew, when um, in the temple there was a an idol put in the temple called jupiter <laughs> that usurp the authority of jehovah and so we see that that's that's just been revised um i mean look seriously if i turned into an atheist or a satanist tomorrow i would have a field that i could go into a church and say oh you guys are worshiping the devil and they'd be like no we're not and i could easily show that they are <laughs> it's like it's so that's how bad it is in these in modern churches it's it's almost like if you get what's happening in modern churches you just turn it upside down you usually get what the bible's teaching and so um and i i'm not joking when i say that if you get what pastors usually teach and preach and practice just get it turn it upside down do the exact opposite and you usually get what the bible's teach <laughs> it's just just amazing it's quite amazing and so but yeah so with the whole thing with yahweh jupiter um that's linked uh you can see it in my book here um and uh yeah and so and i do a whole video on that so you can search for that that's the um jehovah uh, Yahweh uh, video in my my YouTube okay so I'm going to quickly just go through this I'll, I'll keep going but yeah thanks for the questions I don't see them as interruptions that's what I really want if anyone wants to join down the bottom it has join us live if you type that in um, you can join us and um, I've put the link there on the Facebook uh, group and also on the um, YouTube channel so that way you can just click on that and you can join and you can be another bobbing head here or you can just have a picture there or but you can jump on and chat and um, everyone will hear you and see you but um, if you don't want to be seen you can I, I think you can just have a blank screen or something like that but join in that's what this whole thing's about so I'm going to be here for quite a few hours just going through this stuff. If there's anything else you want to know, uh, I wasn't planning on going Revelation 16.5. Someone's just asked for it. So I'm like, cool, let's just do this. And so, um, all right. So we're looking at the Hutter dodecaglot. So this is this is Hutter's work here. Um, I'll just hide that question there and I might make it full screen again. Well, actually, that's not bad with the head there. Okay, so this is Revelation 16.5 here. So he doesn't have um, a, a somenos. He has a commonos, which is interesting because that's actually how uh, Erasmus has it in his annotations. And so then when we read through uh, these other editions, we see it has sanctus here in the Latin, um, which is, you know, um, holy. Then we have which are and which was and holy. So that would match the Geneva Bible. So, yeah, it's quite interesting um, what Hutter has here. Um, so, but it's interesting when you go through the Hebrew of Hutter, you can see that what I, what I was trying to do was point out the name of Jehovah is closely linked to the one which was and is and is to come. And so... You can see verse four here. I've underlined it in red where it's like, um, uh, where it says, you know, uh, Jehovah, which was and is and is to come. Okay. 
or actually in verse four, it doesn't mention the name Jehovah. So that's why I've just got the red line because that's John saying that. Okay. And so um, Revelation 1, 4, uh, but in verse eight, Jesus is saying it. Here's the name Jehovah here. And then we have um, it, um, the Trinity Declaration being said. And so then we have um, chapter 4, verse 8, we have the name Jehovah here, and we see the Trinity Declaration mentioned in the Hebrew there. But then we have um, chapter 11, verse 17, we see Jehovah mentioned here and the Trinity Declaration mentioned there. Um, then Revelation 16, 5, we have Jehovah mentioned and then the Trinity Declaration mentioned there. And so um, in Revelation 16.5, Hata has Yehe, um, which doesn't mean holy. Uh, it means shall be. So it's quite interesting that in his Hebrew, he has the, the same reading as Beza. Um, so, yeah, this is basically a chart that I made just to show. Um, oops, sort of doing some editing. Um, just to show what was mentioned here and so you know revelation 1 4 and how the triad declaration is mentioned and so um i put some space between the letters for those people you know who don't uh, know the hebrew and so basically you got the ands and um and things like that and the conjunctions uh separated and so um and what else did i do here Yeah, so I was just showing, I guess, you know, um, in some of Hutter's work, he has, you know, Paul saying, who art thou, Lord? And it says Adonai. Um, that's Adonai there. And the Lord, so it's, um, and Jehovah said, I am Jesus, who you're persecuting. So that's quite interesting when you go through the Hebrew Bible. It's Paul saying, who are you, Adonai? Who are you, Lord? And 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 Jehovah said, I'm Jesus. <laughs> it's quite interesting. So I go through that type of thing. Um, yeah, but then I come back to it. Kaiho Ekomenos is, um, it means shall be. Okay, so it's not Esomenos. Uh, sorry, it means um, is to come. Sorry. So it's it's not Esomenos, but it's very close. Um, so, yeah, I've just written that out there. Um, yeah, so that's that follows the annotations of Erasmus. So Erasmus has that in his annotations. Um, okay, so then what I'd start doing is going through commentaries, and this is quite a long winded um, area because there's a lot of basically copy and pasting and underlying. So it's like, okay, so this phraseology is purely Jewish. So this is Adam Clark. Um, taken from the Tetragrammaton, uh, Yehovah, which, uh, which is to include in itself all time, pre uh, past, present, and future. But often they use the phrase, um, which the Ho'un, Kaho'en, Kaho'en, of the Apostle as a literal translation. Um, and then he goes through some of these rabbis we've already mentioned, is to come and shall be, etc. Um, Ellicott, he has um, from him which is and was and which is to come or which cometh. Um, it's the name of names. It's related to I am. And so what? why I was doing this was I just wanted James White to see that um, it was not a novel idea, this whole thing of you know, I am being related to Jehovah and being related to the Trade Declaration. The more I looked into it, the more I saw it was just a common thing. And it's like this generation sort of dropped the ball and just doesn't know these things. And so, um, but when when you go, when you're studying the Trade Declarations, because the first one is at Revelation 1.4, that seems to be the place where all the information is. And so that's why most of these are just talking about Revelation 1, 4, but they tend to sort of explain everything, you know, um, to do with it. So I'm not going to read through all these. This is just sort of like, um, well, they actually used to um, say Zeus, Zeus N, Zeus Estin, which mean, means is, and Zeus 
uh, Esetai, which means you basically, you know, Zeus was and is and is to come. Um, so they would say that about their pagan gods. Um, and so I won't go through every single one of them because it does go on and on. But that was put there to show James White that I'm not the only one who's coming up with these concepts. You, you know, he, you know, and most of these are in Revelation 1 4. Uh, and in Beza, what I found was people were going to the notation at uh, Revelation 16 5. But in that notation, he says, Go to Revelation 1 4. I've already talked about this. And so that was where I discovered that he was talking about um, Jehovah and, and the links to I am and things like that. It was like, Wow, okay, let's look into that and look at that angle. So Beza himself wrote the notes of the 1599 Geneva Bible at Revelation 1, 4 and 1, 8, which says 1, 4, that is, from God the Father, eternal, immortal, immutable, whose unchangeableness um, St. John declareth by a form of speech, which is un undeclined. Um, in, then he says, by these three times, is, was, and shall be, is signified by this word, Jehovah. So it's pretty clear. He's saying the Trader Declaration means Jehovah. So when you hear was and is and is to come, it means Jehovah. That's the name of God. And so why isn't there a whole bunch of Trinitarian studies on that? Um, you know, James White could have used this information for, to, to defend the Trinity because it's, you know, it's the one who was and is, is to come and the Father says this. It's like, well, Jesus and the Father, you know. Um, Okay, one eight eternity that is in himself. Um, uh, everything that is made and was made and shall remain. Um, okay, so I don't want to go through all these commentaries because there's lots in there. But yeah, you see these things are gold. You know, Zeus was and is and Zeus, you know, Zeus was, Zeus is and Zeus will be. <laughs> So they were stealing that stuff from the Hebrews. Um, okay, Vincent Word Studies. Um, they say it's in the nominative case. So when you look at the name, the the concept of nomina sacra, nomina sacra means a sacred name or a holy name. So we've already shown that the one who was and is and is to come is a name the most holy name of Jehovah. So if it's a name and then if someone's written holy over it, that means that uh, it's it's a holy name. It's a nominate sacra. And so um, I'm just going to skip down past these commentaries. It pains me to do this, but I understand that we've only got so much time. So we see many triadic patterns in scripture. The Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, yesterday, today, and forever, which is and which was and is to come, etc. Um, to say, even if we had Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and holy, it would make no sense, and a logical inquiry into it would ensue. So um, if some of these patterns were broken up, like you know, the Father, the Word, and Holy, so another Holy Spirit, you know, you'd, you'd you would expect it to be um, to, to continue. And so what we see, Revelation 16, 5, is um, that there's, it's always three, you know, which was and is and is to come, is to come. But then we see was and is and shall be. Um, and we've seen that these are all related to Jehovah. Um, but what we see is it says, and holy. So people in who use the modern text, they're saying, which art and wast. So it says um, you are and you were, but it doesn't say shall be because Bruce Metzger says, oh, no, Jesus had already come back by then, the second coming. And so he, he actually squeezes his eschatology in there to try to explain it away, um, which I do go into in, in this book a little bit, only a tiny bit. Um, but I go through just an example of Peter, James and John. Like these three are mentioned, you know, Peter, James, and John, Matthew uh, 10, 2, Matthew 71, Peter, James, and John, Mark 5, 31, Peter, James, and John, Peter, James, and John. It's, it's through the whole Bible. You can see these patterns that occur. 
that people, you know, they say uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You, you wouldn't expect Abraham, Isaac, and funny guy, or Abraham, Isaac, and banana peel, or a Abraham, Isaac, and holy. You know, it's like, uh huh? Yeah, and so the one which which is and was and holy, it's people in the Reformation period when those Bibles were around like that, they were like, I'm not sure of this, you know. So how did this change? Well, um, okay, so I go through a whole bunch of, you know, triadic things and, you know, all that sort of stuff. Let's just keep going. So then I go through how James White's book, <laughs> he has, you know, he's like, look, uh, here's a picture of um, the English and the Latin, blah, blah, blah. And he doesn't even have the verse appears down the bottom here. <laughs> he doesn't even have the verse in it. I was like, because it says thou art. Yeah, it should say, um, I heard the angel of the waters saying thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast. It doesn't even have it. He cuts it short. And the thing is, no one had noticed. Like, it was about 10 years old, this book. No one had even looked at the picture. I mean, this is the how, how bad the scholarship of apologetics is in America, where, you know, this can be held up as the best book against the King James. And it's like the main picture that he's got there doesn't even have the verse in it. And no one's really even bothered to look at it. It's just like, well, James White is always correct. And so we just... We don't question that. And so, you know, that's the, that's the picture there that he has. And so, um, yeah, so we cut that off at the bottom. Anyway, so I go through and just sort of bash James White up a little bit there. But then I'm going through, okay, what is Nomina Sacra? Okay, so here we have a classic case of uh, Iota and a Upsilon, which would usually mean Yesu. And then we have a uh, theta and a upsilon, which would be theo. Uh, and so um, we see that it's got the line above it, which makes it nomina sacra. So it's a bit like the, the word don't. We put an apostrophe to, you know, we have do not, and we, we put an apostrophe there. And, um, and yeah, it's so uh, we can know that there's been words taken out. So um, this is in Codex Vaticanus. Um, so basically, you you would say that word there, even though it's just two letters, says Jesus. That word here says God. Okay, so it says Yesu and Theu. So it says um, Jesus and God. So very, very clear. Um, so since we've established that the New Testament translations of I am and Jehovah are distinctly relative to which art and was and shall be, which has its own distinct Strong's Concordance Dictionary reference number, being the most holy name in scripture, the sacred name, and being the purest form of the five tradic declarations in Revelation, with shall be and doesn't have is to come, it makes perfect and logical sense to acknowledge that early scribes wrote holy in Greek, hosios, or Latin, sanctus, to designate the tritic declaration in Revelation 16.5 as a nomen sacrum. Actually, that's, an, that's a spelling error there. It should be nomen sacrum. Maybe I'm giving out the, the early edition of my print book. Um, nomen sacra. Um, yeah, I've got it spelled correctly there. Nomina Sacra, uh, singular Nomen Sacrum, is Latin for sacred name. And it's the scribal practice of abbreviating or replacing divine names or titles, especially in Greek. But it, it also occurs in some form in Latin, Coptic, Armenian, Gothic, Old, Nubian, and Cyrillic. Uh, the usual abbreviated Nomen Sacrum forms consist of two or more letters from the original word spanned by an overline. And so... Metzger lists, you know, that God, Lord, Jesus, Christ, Son, you know, all of these can be nomina sacra. Um, uh, so we see that P75, they have pneuma, um, but it actually has quite a lot of, um, 
yeah, well, it's written in nomina sacra form. Sorry. Um, you saw the, the initial system of nomina sacra consisted of four or five words called um, nomina divina. Um, the Greek words for Jesus Christ, Lord God, and possibly spirit. The practice quickly expanded to a number of other words um, reg regarded as sacred in the system of nomina sacra that came to prevail abbreviation is by contraction meaning that the first and last letter um so most of you know how nomina sacra works okay so i'll just go back down so we do have uh cases like um like here uh papyrus 18 they write um uh, jesus christos um uh, jesus christ as um iota eta and uh, key uh, and row and so um, contraction however offered the practical advantage of indicating the case of the abbreviated noun so that that was that they can also have Greek, because greek's an inflected language you you're looking at what case it is uh at the end um of the word and so you, you can spot it there so the greeks did this uh with numbers as well they abbreviated numbers and or they put lines above numbers, I should say. Um, okay, so. So there was always something about the. Um, the name of Jehovah that even, you know, in the Septuagint, which I believe is an AD document, not a BC document. Uh, recent textual discoveries cast out on the idea that the compilers of the LXX, the Septuagint, translated the Tetragrammaton um, YHWH by Curios. The oldest LXX manuscript fragments now available to us have the Tetragrammaton written in Hebrew characters. Uh, in the Greek text, this custom was retained by latter Jewish translators of the Old Testament in the first centuries AD. And so... Um, and then I sort of bag James White out a little bit for stuff that he said um, and just sort of hold him accountable to some of the things that he said. Um, yeah, and so even the Jews who have Lord and God and things like that, and they abbreviate things. Um, or sometimes the name of God can be just called Hashem. And so if you're ever listening to a Hebrew audio Bible, it might say um, uh, Jehovah in the in the written text but they always pronounce it as adonai and so um or sometimes replace adonai with hashem which means the name um so yeah so i'm gonna go through i'm just gonna skip through this bit because it gets quite technical we don't need to know all these technical details but it's just basically going through nominus sacra Okay, so here we see um, a Syriac manuscript, uh, which is on uh, sideways, which clearly has the Hebrew tetragrammaton written there. Okay, so it's, they've, they've written it clearly in Hebrew. Um, okay. Here we see some forms of Jehovah and how it was written. Um, In some of the manuscripts. Um, here we have some of the earliest um, Greek transcriptions of Jehovah. Yah, Yahba, Yah, Yah, Yahoba, Yahoba. And so we see you know, Jehovah is very, very old. Um, you know, so um <clears throat> okay um so yeah this is a form of nomina sacra as well this is in uh, a manuscript the sterogram um so we have that type of thing, um, the road cross. Um, 
Okay. So yeah, when we look at the Tetragrammaton, just a, a cursory look at Wikipedia, it has common substitutions for the Hebrew form, uh, Hokadesh uh, Barakhu, or the Holy One. So this is exactly how modern translations translate that, the Holy One, the one who was and is and the Holy One, instead of shall be. It's quite interesting. It's just, just, <laughs> just a... a general thing on wikipedia on the tetragrammaton and they're, they're mentioning these type of things it's it's, it's quite interesting um okay so i go through a little bit more stuff can what what a conjectural emendation is a conjectural emendation um actually before i go into that i'm just going to click on this so flame on youtube uh, by the way, discovered you through David Palman's Facebook. Thanks for your civility and heart for truth. Thanks, um, Justin Orwell um, wrote that. I said flame for truth wrote it, but it's Justin Orwell. Yeah, I've, I've looked at David Palman's material. Um, I've just, just yesterday, I've, I've been invited to, so I should know who all these atheists are, but I do, like in all honesty, I, I, had a pretty powerful conversion experience. It was sort of like a Paul on the road to Damascus sort of thing. And so to me, the whole you know, arguing about the existence of God and all that, it's like I was a fully blown atheist and I just was turned around and like, wow, that God's real. And so you know, debating philosophy and stuff like that has never really interested me. But I understand that there are people out there who um, who get persuaded by this sort of, this type of thing. And so... I'll just show you who I'm debating. So we just worked out the time yesterday. <clears throat> and so it's going to be, I'm pretty sure, on August the 5th, I'm going to be debating um, a guy called T-Jump. Um Okay, so I'll just get him on there. So it looks like he just sort of sits on his couch and and chats. So maybe I can get that as a big picture up there. This guy. This guy here. So <clears throat> uh, I'm going to be debating him. So... Um, that would be more in the realm of you know someone like david palman or you know uh, but he he actually it's not sorry it's not a debate he just wants to ask me questions but what i um tend to find is um people who he's asking questions um to he's really sort of debating them you know so anyway um yeah so welcome on board justin orwell um yeah, I, like I find David Palman's uh, interest for truth is very refreshing and his thirst for knowledge. But, I mean, you know, it's like, um, you yeah, know, um, Flame for Truth was asking me about, you know, books and stuff to read. I mean, you can save yourself a lot of time just by going to good sources. And, um, I mean, it's a bit like if you were to read about American politics, would you read, you know, all about, what Hillary Clinton's written or, you know, um, or, you know, uh, would, would you, you read the, the memoirs of Michelle Obama? You know, it's like, there's a lot of stuff out there that you can waste your time in. If you really wanted to know what was going on, you'd go to better sources than that. And so hopefully I've given some better uh, sources. Um, there's a lot of fluff out there. And I sort of find that um, David, you know, he's trying to, breathe in everything but it's like uh and and good on him uh, like if you're going to really represent um a foe as well you've got to read the material i mean if you want to know everything about something you've got to read all all the material out there and which is something that, that i um, constantly tell people to do to know both sides of the story um, but I do find, you know, he's sort of wading in, you know, the Bart Ehrman stuff and he won't even, anyone, you know, KJV stuff to him is just like, you know, well, he doesn't really know that much about it, which shows me that he doesn't know the other side. He, he would, um, do well to, you know, read 
a whole bunch of stuff for like three months just on the King James side. He thinks he knows the King James side. He knows a quirky. It's it's like having it's like being a Seventh Day Adventist, um, young Earth creationist sort of thing. And he knows what his pastor said, you know. And it's like, um, dude, there's so much more out there. And when I listen to him, he just has this um, uh, understanding of. Um, KJV issues or Texas receptors issues that's really not well educated. Um, he doesn't know that much about the issues. And so I actually did a video on him and was it Will from the church split? Uh, they were chatting about something and I just couldn't help myself. I had to do a video on it. It's like, guys, come on, get better arguments. If, if you're going to call yourself apologists, you don't want to look like uh, you know nothing about this issue, you know. At least someone like Matt Slick will look like he knows what he's saying. <laughs> you know what I mean? At least look like you, you, you're fudging your way through. Um, and so Flame on YouTube said, um, by the way, discovered you through David Pellman's Facebook. Actually, I really appreciate your civility and respect. Hmm. Okay, that's interesting because Justin Orwell has said the exact same comment. Um, okay, awesome. Maybe both of you have uh, come from David Palman's Facebook. So, okay, that's interesting because I don't write that much stuff there, but every now and then I'll just throw, I'll throw a spanner in the works or um, just have a bit of a chat. And uh, I know that recently he's sort of like I, I sort of followed the Kent Hovine thing. Um, our church was showing his videos back in like the noughties. And then, you know, he went to jail. And for us, we just sort of thought, well, he's like a libertarian trying to fight the system, you know, um, coming against the, you know, the, um, you know, tax, taxation is theft, all that sort of stuff, which is, you know, I, I think there's a lot of admirable um, concepts. Um, okay, so same person. Um, yes, uh, I think there's a lot of admirable uh, concepts to, you know, the whole, you know, having small government and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, that we're way overtaxed here in Australia, we're way overtaxed. And so anyone who's like anti-tax or can find a loophole, it's like, great, you know. And so um, I know that, you know, well, from where I sat, I, I watched the whole thing transpire. And then I was like, well, this guy's going to jail for quite a long time. And I can't remember how long he was in jail for. But then when he got out, he was sort of straight away with Stephen Anderson, but then they had a fallout and it was like, okay, well, uh, then he was sort of coming against the pre-tribulation rapture, which I believe in. Um, and I think I actually said I'll debate you on that, but I, I guess you know, when he came out, he would have been um, you know, quite popular. Um, you know, a lot of people would have been saying, well, atheists and uh, other people would have been saying, I'll debate you. So um, he wouldn't have known who I was. But, um, yeah, I guess that there's this video out about him made by atheists and they sort of interview his ex-wives and they sort of make out that, you know, he's been abusive and things like that. Look, I, I sort of wrote on David Palman's page, like I, I can sort of maybe be concerned about 15% of that, but I found a lot of it was just hype. And even just the beginning, the scary music, and it's like, you don't have to do that if you just if you just present the facts. Some of the facts were presented in such a way that you could make anyone look abusive. You could make anyone look like a psycho. And so, I'm not saying I'm defending um, uh, Ken Hovine. Um, I'm doing a fair bit of debate on uh, Standing for Truth, who obviously you know they have similar views to Ken Hovine. Um, I'm not saying I'm defending him. I, I'm just saying that. It's just not convincing to me. And I've been involved in, um, like, I was instrumental in exposing Hillsong. One of the reasons why Hillsong, the founder of um, Hillsong was a, a child molester. He, it's 14 little boys that he, he's raped that we found out about so far. Um, but his son covered it up. And so I was instrumental. We rang up the Royal Commission. We gave them a whole bunch of inf information. Um we gave them emails. We were in contact with a former Assembly of God um, secretary uh, who knew these people personally and uh, had departed from their fellowship. And so he was giving us a bunch of information. 
uh, back in 2007, I was trying on Wikipedia to change the Frank Houston page to show that he was a pedophile. And I had Hillsong people paid to go through that page to make it so he wasn't a pedophile. And it's quite interesting. The cover-up's been going on for years. So I'm used to you know, looking at church cover-ups and things like that and who's bad and who's good and who's... A... But when I watched the Ken Hovind thing, I was just like, it's just like I, I find um, that David Pullman, he had a whole uh, whole range of issues with Answers in Genesis saying, oh, they're this and they're that because of the testimony of one girl who said that she wanted to pray for someone on campus and, and someone came up and said, hey, you can't pray for anyone on campus because they're working there. Like, I understand there's got to be rules and things like that. Or else you just get these spiritual, ultra spiritual Bethelites, you know, just really lengthening everyone's leg and you know, all the, all that. And it's like, so they're like, look, you just work here. If you want to do all that, do it later. And and then, you know, it was like, oh, it was digging into a church time or something like that. And, and so she's sort of written this, this whole, all this stuff, but it's like, at the end of the day, um, I, I just don't, yeah. You know, t- the testimony of one or two people here and there, it's like, it's not that convincing. I mean, there are literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who work for instance in Genesis. Now, I, I don't, I'm not saying that things haven't happened. I'm not saying they're angels either. I'm just saying it's like he has a full um, vindictive thing against Genesis in Genesis um and it's just and it's like sort of like okay well what's the reason and, and he's his reasons are sort of like just someone's testimony i guess david's never had someone testify against him that's been wrong where i have i've had um when i was a teenager i was falsely accused of raping a mentally retarded girl and i had to give blood and and stuff to prove my innocence and then eventually i found out who did it and um and it's like, you know, he went to jail and all the rest of it. But it was like, that was a pretty big thing to happen to a 14-year-old. So to have a whole community go, so did you do it? And and people years later saying, why did you do that to that girl? Why? I'm like, I didn't do it. You know? And trying to pr- prove your innocence. And it's like, uh, you know, I, I just, I'm always on, I'm, I'm always being careful of just slandering people, you know, and just, and just um, I'm always aware that, some i've been in um church circles for years and i've seen people leave church and say a million things about the past or about me about a whole bunch of people and it's like none of it's true but for the for her audience or his audience they they think it's true because they're saying it and it must be true you know um it's like the whole me too movement just just believe them you know uh where i'm, I'm like no i'll 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 take that into consideration, but um, there's always innocence until proven guilty, you know? Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, I just thought I'd mention that. Anyway, I'm going to get quickly back into this Revelation 16, uh, 16, 5 issue here. Okay, so James White was saying no one knew of the reading of... Um, Revelation 16.5 uh, shall be until Theodore Bees had changed it and amended it, okay? So then I go through some of the conjectural emendations uh, in the Nestle Alan, like, um, you know, 2 Peter uh, 3.10. And James White actually retracted, uh, or he didn't retract, he, he actually said, oh, I don't follow the Nestle Alan 28th edition. I go with Tinder House because it doesn't have this conjectural emendation, because he's been going around saying Revelation 16.5 is a conjectural emendation. So I point out, okay, well, what about here and there where, where you guys have that? Uh, and he didn't know about it. And he's like, I go with Tinder House. You know, <laughs> it's just so bizarre. And even the other day when there was a debate between Will Kinney and Francis Turretin, he goes with the NA 27th edition because they don't have these conjectures in there. It's like... Okay, and so yeah, these um, it was me, James Snap, Jeff Riddle. We were bringing this sort of stuff up, so I touch on all that, but I'm skipping over it because it's a bit of a side issue. Yarn Kranz, what he says a conjectural emendation is. Okay, so chapter three, and so this is the argument that James White's making. John did not write and shall be. He wrote, "Oh, holy one." Oops, that's weird. Oh, holy one. This is the United Testimony of all relevant historical information. 
listen to this, to deny this is to engage in the most egregious form of irrational thought. So I'm, I'm being so irrational here, you know. It is not faith to deny reality. It is deception. So he says many harsh things like that in his book. Like if you believe in Revelation 16, 5, you are the, you know, the dumbest of dumb. You are, you know, the, the scum of the earth when it comes to apologetics. Um, so are we deceived? And so we go through this. The earliest witnesses to Revelation 16, 5 read, this is um, P47, third century. It reads, Ho'un kai um, os and kai osios. And so, okay, it has that. So the, the Sinaiticus has um, Ho'un kai ho en ho osios. Okay, and so we have Alexandrius, uh, Alexandrinus, um, fifth century, um, Ho'un Kai Ho En Ozios. So we see there's a Kai missing, um, there's a definite article missing. Uh, these are the third witnesses. No, sorry, these are the three witnesses. There's only four witnesses before the 10th century of this verse. Okay, so I'll just point that out. Um, and we also see that there was a Kai in P47. The Kai, where was it going? It, it has the one who was and is and holy. Where we know it, our one has the one who was and is and shall be. This one has the one who was and is and holy. Okay. So my take is that the holy it has been put on the end of the most holiest name of God. This is an, a noun phrase and they've put this um, holy on there. So sometimes they put it in different places, you know. Um, okay, so that's the Kai in um, P47. It's going on, it's a conjunction. It's going on to say something, but it doesn't really join anything. It just says and holy, which is quite strange. Uh, so it would have been going on to say Kai Ho um, but they've got holy there. Um, so it's like several people have asked, and what? What was P47 going on to read? And so that's the oldest reading. Um, and so... <clears throat> so NA28 omits that Kai. Why doesn't it have it? Because it doesn't make sense. Okay. Um, okay, so, so this would be the reading in P47, righteous art thou, O being one, and the one who was and the holy one. It sort of leaves you going, well, that doesn't really make much sense. Okay. Um, but this... This here is just like, I'm nitpicking. I'm really nitpicking here, okay? So it's not like my main argument or anything. I'm just like, okay, P47 has the word and there. Why don't you have it in your manuscript? It's the oldest. Yeah, isn't it the oldest and the best and all this? Well, it doesn't make much sense. Well, when is, isn't it the hardest reading? <laughs> that would be the hardest reading. Why don't you go with the harder reading? You know, it's because it doesn't make any sense. And it also sort of uh, is a reading that, backs up the TR more than backing up the uh, critical text, but it's a slight little thing. Okay, so then we have Betis. Um, I think I've gone a bit far. Or Jerome has shall be. And so we see here um, John Wordsworth. Um, He assumed that the quote was from Revelation 1 4, but it reads just like Betus, who we shall examine soon. And so he is et futurus s, which means uh, shall be, you shall be. Translated as um, so also the thousands of years of it to thee, you shall be, and you are, and you have been. Now, I know that that is probably a bad translation um, here, but the futurus s uh, is definitely you shall be. So. Um, just to clarify that. So Jerome has the reading of shall be um, there in uh, Revelation 16.5. Uh, sorry, in 
in a triadic declaration, which he said was Revelation 1 4. Um, Clement of Alexandria. Um, so he has, uh, talking about the name of Jehovah, um, he referred to God as uh, Kaiho um, Esomenos. So basically, it has who is and shall be. Okay, so it doesn't have the was. And so it says, um, further, the mystic name of the four letters was affixed to those alone to whom um, the additum was accessible is called. Um, now, that's translated from that. Yahweh. And they've got uh, Yahweh. So obviously, that's a modern. Um, uh, how would you say it? They've already got a presupposition that it's Yahweh, so they've just gone Java, you know, so which is interpreted who is so basically it's the, the, the sacred name of God is the Tetragrammaton, uh, Yao, which was, to me is more closer to Jehovah, Jehovah, you know, um, who is and was and shall be, or sorry, who is and shall be. So it doesn't have the was, the past tense, but it's explaining the name, okay? So um, here we have Clement. He has Ho'un, so he doesn't have the Kaiho N, but he has Kaiho S Somino. So it's not that strong, but I'm just putting all the evidence there. Okay. So, but at the end, you'll see none of this evidence really matters at, at all. Yeah. It's just, I'm just sort of going through going, okay, well, here's some more evidence. Uh, I just wanted to cover every base. Um, Okay, so Gregory of Nyssa um, referred to Christ as Ho Esomenos, um, Ho En Kai um, Pruon, is it Pruon? Pruon, uh, Kai Esomenos. And so it's translated as who is and was and shall be. Okay, so. And verily the adorner of the bride of Christ who is and was and shall be, blessed now and forevermore. So that's the reading of Revelation 16.5 there. So this is Gregory of Nyssa. He's quoting that. Um, okay, so uh, Priscillian of Avila uh, wrote Et Futurus Est, um, which would be translated as he is that who was, is and shall be, and appeared as the word from eternity, uh, was made flesh, dwelt among us. So yeah, and shall be is is written there. Um, whether these are strong or weak, uh, I was just putting. You know, I was given a lot of of these type of things. Um, Basil of uh, Caesarea, fourth century, has it was and it is and it always will be, um, and it gives the being existence to everyone because it is he who is by nature. Okay. Um, whoops, who's that? Then he has another one. Et erit semper always will be. Um, so yeah, you can see I'm just going through these guys. You know, I'll, I'll, I know there's quite a lot of these. So and some of them are strong, some of them are weak, but I've just got them all there. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, very long winding, absolutely. And so, what I'll do is I'll try to Gregory of Nazianzus, uh, Caius Day, and always will exist. It's quite interesting. Uh, he is clearly speaking of the eternality of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, then always existed, is the wast, and exists, art, and always will exist, shall be. So it has the um, reading of Revelation 16.5 in there. Um, so we see Alcan of York, et eris, uh, sorry, et eras. So it has here holy, the Holy Spirit who art always in all things and wast before all things and shall be God over all things blessed forever. So who art and wast and shall be is there. Um, it's interesting that that is the reading of Beza um, in his Latin uh, in his 
1582, it has quies, quieres, uh, eras, sorry, and quieres, which is exactly what um, Erasmus has in his Latin. So it's quite interesting. Um, so yeah, a lot of this is sort of like, okay, we're going through it and we're, we're chewing through the weeds. Um, but we see that, um, is this Betis of Libana? Um, yeah, Betis of Libana, um, 730 to 800, he, he did a commentary on um, Revelation. And so he has et futuris s, which means and will be, which was basically and shall be. So there's 31 existing manuscripts of that and uh, they have et futuris s. Sometimes they have it in the margin. Sometimes they have it in the main text. Sometimes they have it in both places. Sometimes they had it underneath the picture. Um, so sometimes the main text would have and it shall be holy. So it had both. So it had and shall be then the holy written afterwards. And so this the the best explanation for these holies being in different places is that people were saying this is the holiest name of God in the New Testament and they're writing holy next to them. Sometimes replacing a somenos, sometimes after a somenos, um, but the holy is all over the place there. Um, so the word at futurus s or shall be appears twice in this picture. So this, uh, you know, it appears um, in the text. And so I've gone through that and looked at it. Um, I think I zoom in there. Yeah, I've got. So if you want to do all the homework, go through my book, you can see all that. Uh, Hamo halbestedensis. Well, it's, it's got a, a name that's really good to um, learn how to speak in tongues with. Um, picture and translation of KJV today. So he has qui eras, um, justice et s and eris. So eris means the future Latin of shall be. So um, eris there. So thou art just who art holy in times past is used here for three times. That is for past, present and future who were holy are and shall be just. So it's quite interesting um, what's said there. So um, I'll just keep going. <clears throat> Erasmus, um, so in his annotations, in all of his annotations, actually, he has here ho on, ho en, ho e, e komenos, which means is to come. It doesn't actually mean shall be. Um, okay, so... So yeah, he has it in all of, all of his editions. So you can see it here as well. Ho on ho en ho echomenos. Um, okay, so we're getting down to the end of the book. So this was mentioned actually by Isaac Newton. Uh, he talks about the um, Erasmus had echomenos, uh, but Beza has esomenos. So Isaac Newton knew a lot more than James White. Okay, so I'll just keep going down. Okay, so then I try and summarize it here. But then we look at the Ethiopic Bible. Okay, so the Ethiopic Bible of Walton, um, it basically says, um, which has been and shall be. Okay, so has the reading, the Asomenos reading there. And so... We can look at Hos Hoskia. He pointed out that it has et future s in the Latin, which would be in the uh, London polyglot of 1657, which equals and shall be. And so I've, I've double checked all that and it's uh, very clear that that's what it says. Um, okay, so it's in the Ethiopic. So the Ethiopic was in 1549 is when it was translated. And so... Um, that was before Theodore Beza. Now, the next translation to be made of that caliber was the Syriac Bible. And the the key person for the Syriac Bible later on was Tremelius, who was basically um, Theodore Beza's best best friend, with along with Janius. And these three guys produced a Latin Bible that lasted for about 300 years in the Protestant circles. Um 
Okay, so and I go through this whole thing with these three guys. So that's Cedobiza, um, that's Janius, and that's Tremelius. So Tremelius was a Jewish uh, guy, so he um, was fluent in the Syriac language. Um, so basically, um, this whole section is in answer to James White because he said Theodore Beza didn't know about an Ethiopic translation. And so I go through all the hoops and show how Tremelius, he did the Syriac, and the guys who did the Syriac were the same guys who did the Ethiopic version, and he would have known this. So, okay, so... Um, Then just a quote from John Calvin. Uh, yeah, so then I've got Theodore Beza's, you know, this is where it first appears where he's got a hot as Somenos, um, putting it instead of hot Osios there. <clears throat> okay, so we, we see that um, this is the pattern in modern Bibles. It would be the uh, Komenos and then at the end, Osios, a holy. It doesn't seem to make that much sense that you have a tritic declaration all the way through, and then you have, I guess, there's a biotic de declaration, just just two. Uh, but the strange thing is, they actually omit the last one off Revelation eleven seventeen as well, and they also add in Revelation one eight God, um, the God who was and is and is to come. It's like okay, um, so basically, Beza put. Uh, as someone else there so that's the change so why did Beza do this okay so i wrote this and then um jeff riddle retranslated what he had um written there so i'm, I'm just going to go to jeff riddle <clears throat> yeah, I think I've been, I haven't been shown this screen. I'm sorry about that. And I've been talking about pictures and all sorts of things on there. And, um, okay. Okay, well, basically, um, to cut a long story short, Jeff Riddle, uh, he retranslated this and showed that Theodore Beza said uh, clearly that um, he changed it because of an ancient manuscript that he had with the reading of Asomenos. So that's why he changed it. So he had an ancient manuscript, but he also said that it is related to Jehovah. It's a nomina sacra. And... Um, And then he says, so why not truthfully, with good reason, write Ho um, Ecomenos as before in four other places, namely 1, 4, 8, 4, 8, and 11, 17. Because the point is um, the just Christ shall come away from there and bring them into being. Uh, in this way, he will, in fact, appear sitting in judgment and exercising his just and eternal decrees. And so he knew that um, Ecomenos the reading of um, Erasmus was not correct. And so uh, Beza, with the precedence of 5th century, Jerome reading of and shall be, the 8th century Betus reading of and shall be, the 9th century Hamo reading of shall be, the 1549 Ethiopic translation reading of shall be, uh, the Kaiho um, Esomenos reading of Clement in the 3rd century relating to Jehovah, the Tr Tremelius Genius and Calvin de definition of I am and Jehovah being shall be, as also Luther and Coverdale, who at Exodus uh, 3.14 read will be. He also looked at the content of the verse um, that the second coming was the very next thing and chose Esomenos over Erasmus's Ercomenos, um, although he did admit that Erasmus had good reason to choose hot er Ecomenos, Beza having mused upon these concepts for many years, um, using Erasmus' ceiling as his platform, elected shall be for good reason. Um, okay, so...
so Junius, uh, in his fifteen ninety four English translation, has which art and which was and which shall be. So he adopted it. Um, in the London Polyglot, Walton's Polyglot, um, in the Arabic, it just has um, Eterna in Latin, which is the eternal one of eternity, past, present, and future, or I am. So that's what it says in Arabic. It doesn't say the one who was and is needs to come. It says eternal, which is like I am or shall be, you know, or I guess shall be, you know, was and is needs to come would be in that. Um, okay. So then I go through some of the uh, King James translators um, material. The Dutch um, Stuttenberg uh, sorry, Stutton Vertling uh, Bible has uh, who is and was and who will be. So it's the exact reading of uh, Beza and uh, the King James. Um, okay. Uh, the Elzevers. Yeah, it's quite interesting that in their first edition, they had um, Curie uh, A. On kai ho en uh, kai ho ozios, holy. Um, but later on in the 1533, they have curio curie e ho en uh, kai ho on kai ho e komenos. Um, and so they changed it back to um, Beza's reading, realizing that it's superior. So let's conclude. So um, <clears throat> this is what James White said. Thankfully, there isn't the slightest doubt to what John wrote here, and only a misguided dedication to a human tradition would cause anyone to believe otherwise. Christians are people of truth, and I truly exhort any KJV-only advocate to seriously consider this text, to examine the documentation provided, and to recognise King James only is for what it is, an unfounded tradition that flies in the face of truth. Um, so I did that and that's why I wrote this book because James White wrote that and he challenged me to study this. Um, okay, so let me, let's me let look at this. Jehovah comes from to be and is related to the Tritic Declaration. So White denied this on Twitter. Jesus is, Jesus who, sorry, it, Jesus who is to come shall be is Jehovah. Okay, so we've gone through that. I am also means who is and was and shall be. Okay. I am in English Bible version shows shall be is a reasonable reading. Hata has shall be in his Hebrew edition and is to come in his Greek. Okay. The New Testament Hebrew of Hata at Revelation 16.5 is akin to Hava to be. So it's the same type of reading. Um, most commentaries concerning the Tritic Declaration related to Jehovah and I am. The Tritic Declaration is a com complete name with its own Strong's number. The holy in the manuscripts is a form of nomina sacra. That's why the manuscripts read holy. When So when people say to me, okay, the manuscripts that we have today of Revelation, if you read a Revelation 16.5, they all read holy. And I say yes, because it's nomina sacra. Just like if you go through those manuscripts, there are places where they only have the name of Jesus is two letters or the name of God is to, you know, the word theos is two letters. Um, but we understand nomina sacra is expanded. And so... This, because it was a huge name, it's a noun phrase. How, how, do you contract all of those? You know, the, the one who was and is and shall be, do you contract the whole thing? No, you leave it and you just put holy on the end. or uh, And that's why we see holy in different places. Sometimes it has um, the one who was and is holy. The, the one who was and is and holy. The one who was and is and shall be holy. It's you can see it all over the place there because they're telling you this is a, a sacred, this is the most sacred name in the whole New Testament. 
And so that's why they're putting Holy there. So now you can see every manuscript, if that's understood as a nomina sacra, says the one who was and is and shall be. Um, I, I hope you're seeing this, you know. The Tritic Declaration is the original sacred name. So if the Tritic Declaration means Jehovah, then it is the original sacred name of God. It's 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 not like oh a you know sometimes they're like oh Mary or heaven or what no this is this is the whole reason was because of Jehovah it's it's the name of God you know P forty six uh, has and that B is appointed to which was going on to fulfill the triad so p46 being an old manuscript it has the and the conjunction but it um, and holy doesn't make sense and that's why theodore Beza he said in his notes that the reading was uh foolish um to have and holy as the geneva bible does jerome has shall be in the triad declaration clement of alexandria speaking of jehovah used as Somonos, knowing the correct New Testament uh, reading of Revelation 16.5. Gregory of Nyssa calls Christ the Asomenos. Betus of Libana has shall be in both his Vulgate text and also his commentary. Hymo Halbus Stadensis has shall be in his commentary. Desiderius Erasmus has the Triac Declaration as is to come in his annotations in all five editions. Luther, Coverdale and Calvin um, had will be for I am in or will be would be shall be as well uh, for I am in Exodus uh, 314 uh, the Ethiopic of 1549 has shall be at Revelation 165 Tremelius and Janius shared editions with Beza and their edition adopted Beza's shall be reading uh, as soon as it came out in 1582 um, John Calvin defined Jehovah and I am as the Triadic Declaration. Theodore Beza explained in his um, 1582 footnote that the Triadic Declaration appears when Jehovah appears. Okay. The KJV translators did not slavishly follow Beza, um, but chose to adopt Shelby, knowing that Beza was correct. So at times they actually departed from the text of Beza, so I'm going through a series showing that um but here they didn't they knew that he was correct the king james version translators left no note or italic in john 223 um and so they they put an italic there knowing that it was a minority reading here they didn't do that they didn't consider this as a minority reading they saw it as an explanation of a, a nomina sacra um, the Dutch Staten Vertling also independently chose the reading and left no italic or footnote. Um, James White says the pronunciation of Jehovah is false and Yahweh is true against the basic facts. James White in the Jack Mormon debate claimed that Nomina Sacra was originally designed to save space in manuscripts. <laughs> it's like he doesn't understand Jehovah, he doesn't understand I, you know, anything. James White claimed Beza changed the reading to make it nice and poetic and rhythmic but failed to reveal the link to Jehovah I am and how it is a complete formula of the most holy name of God. This is the most holy name of God in the New Testament. James White didn't know that. And so it, it just goes to show you he's he doesn't know anything about this. In his book, in his debates, I went through all of it to do with Revelation 16, 5. He didn't know anything. Everything that he said was wrong. He said it wasn't in the Ethiopic, in his book, in his footnote. And that's where it was. <laughs> it's like it's there. <laughs> and um, yeah, so James White claimed it's there's not a question about it on anyone's part as to what the passage actually reads. But many questioned it. From Erasmus, even Lorenzo Valla thought it was part of a Trinitarian formula. Although uh, to the King James translators, Elzivers, etc. Oh, sorry, through to the King James translators, Elzivers, etc. James White says Beza simply made up a reading. Why should I take Theodore Beza's conjectural imitation where he decides a reading on the basis of what he likes? And the King James Version contains a reading created out of the mind of Theodore Beza. 
And that's the exact words of Stephen Boyce. He said, oh, created out of the mind of Theodore Beza. Yeah. Um, James White said, nobody before Theodore Beza ever had the idea that Revelation 16.5 read that way and was unknown to the ancient church, unknown to all Christians until the end of the 16th century. But many people thought it read that way. Um we you know we've seen many people you know beat us like banner the whole and these aren't just you know odd little things here and there like the say beat us like banner was a very popular uh commentary uh Hymo, Halber, Stadensis, his commentary is very very popular so people knew this reading um james white claimed every greek text not just the alexandrian text but all greek text majority text the byzantine text every manuscript and so this is where in my book after I've written the book, um, Theodore Beza's um, footnote has been updated and it's been shown to prove that um, um, Theodore Beza was saying he had an ancient manuscript with this reading. So it cannot be ever called a conjectural emendation. What it shouldn't have been anyway. Um, but what was this manuscript? They don't know. And so this is one of the things people don't know what manuscripts they had. They, they, this, uh, how come it's taken people like me and Jeff Riddle and, and, and uh, like to, to discover this sort of stuff? What are they, what are these guys doing in Munster? They're not looking into this stuff. They're not trying to discover this stuff. They're just trying to bolster points for being Aleph. And you know, James White's um, believe there was sufficient similarity between the Greek terms Hosios and Esomenos the future form shall be to allow him to make the change to harmonize the text, but he didn't do that. It's not what um, Beza said he did. Um, so he's saying it's a conjectural emendation, um, blah, blah, blah. He's saying it's not in the Coptic Ethiopic, um, but that's where the Ethiopic does have it. <laughs> and so it's like, what's he talking about? And so I've got a whole bunch of stuff here against James White in his book. Um, but so at the end of the day, um, at the end of the day, you can clearly see that I've proven that Revelation 16.5 with the reading of the past, the present and the future is the purest form of the Tritic Declaration, the one who was and is and is to come appears four times the one who was and is and shall be the is the final form um and it the shall be is a, a purer form than is to come of the e explanation of jehovah um we see that jehovah comes from hava which means to be this is related to i am so the holiest names of god in the entire bible appear here um what you'll find is in some of the older um older bibles they actually capitalize um or i, I actually i think it's in theodore beza i might just jump back up there i'll go right back to the beginning yeah see he's um He's got Domine here in the Latin, uh, quies, quieris, and sanctus. So even in that, he's, it's capitalized because they know it's like a name. And so, but obviously he's gone hot as Somenos over that. And so the Osios was put there as a type of nomina sacra. It's the type of nomina sacra that we see in the Old Testament um, to do with the name of Jehovah. Um, and so um yeah so if you've got any questions any comments um i've just sort of skimmed through my book i mean there's lots of places where i could have stopped and talked about it. i think there was a long period of time there i was actually showing my face just talking and not showing you all the evidence and i was thinking that you guys were seeing what i'm seeing on the second screen and so sorry about that um these this is just early days with my uh live show so i'll get better and better as i go along but um, yeah, so hopefully that answers the question from Facebook user. Could you please restate what the issue is with the Revelation 16.5? <laughs> so I've just zipped through that in like, you know, three hours or something. 
two hours and 34 minutes. So how does this relate to Revelation 1, uh, 8? So as I was going through Revelation 1, 8, um, and I was showing you Erasmus and a few other things, uh, um, so we see that, say, the Complutensian polyglot has theos here, okay? Hot theos at Revelation 1.8. See, for me, this is because it's just before ho'on, kaiho'en, kaiho'ekomenos. It's just before the Trite Declaration. So we see they're saying the Lord, and then it's like maybe in the manuscripts it's like how do we put this in brackets that that's the name of god that's the name of jehovah that's that's a sacred name there that's like having i am there you know it's, it's an important thing to to jewish people this is like yeah that if they know that's in a manuscript many times they i go into this in my book they used to cut those pieces out and burn the rest of the manuscript you know because you can't burn the name of god and and so it was this was considered very sacred. Um, and so, yeah, we see that the ho curios ho on kaho en kaho e komenos um, is in uh, in the Greek of Erasmus at 1 8 here, but it doesn't have the theos there. And so, and that is followed by uh, most of the editions. And we see when we get to Beza's 1598 edition, um, yeah, we see it's Hokurius, uh, Ho'on, Kaho'en, Kaho'ekomenos, Ho Pantocrator. So it's interesting, the Pantocrator thing um, was it my discovery. Uh, if we go to Revelation. 16.5 here. I'll go back up at the top. Um, so there was an issue also with the word Lord. It doesn't appear in a lot of the texts. And so obviously the Lord triggers the triadic declaration. So this has been one of the attacks against it. Um, we see Curie there. English Bibles, Lord. Now, this is this is an interesting thing here in Psalm 119, verse 137. Um, so we see in Hatta, he did a um, Hebrew and Greek um, edition of the Old Testament. So it's quite interesting to go through this. And... Um, he also translates it into Latin and into German. So, it, yeah, it's, it's quite an interesting looking uh, Bible. So let's look at the similarities between these. Okay, so we have um, righteous art thou, O Lord, and upright are thy judgments. Okay, Revelation 16 has thou art righteous, O Lord. And so this would be just an expansion of the word Lord, which art and was and shall be, because it means Jehovah, because you have judged us. Okay, so there's, there's judging, there's the up, um, uprightness, you know, righteousness. Okay, so, um, and then it's echoed again, even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. Okay, so if we look at the Greek that Hatta has, this is in his psalm, it's um, um, dikaios a curie, um, a euthes, a crisis su. So if we look at um, verse 5 of Revelation uh, 16, we see it has dikaios, okay, and we see the E is, um, it's changed position, but it's still there. The curie is still there, and it has the chi, the, the conjunction there. Um, and so this means the Lord or Jehovah, this whole phrase. Ho'on, kaho'en, kaho'ekomenos. It means Jehovah. So you can see the similarities there. I mean, most of that verse is is put here. 
and or actually um ho krisisu uh sorry a krisisu um it appears in verse seven so here he is echoing it again ne curie um and then he's got ho theos ho pantocrator which means the god the almighty okay so that would be i guess i'm i'm sort of putting here you know that he's echoing lord because it's you know curie he's he's mentioning pantocrator here and then he's got um kai dikai um a krisisu and so this is the exact type of language in the psalm which is echoed so it's quite interesting if, if you go through that now um also he's got latin so the similarities in latin um you can see that there as well so it's very similar 137 is very similar to um to the latin in, in revelation 16 5 um and so then you see the expansion of jehovah there um and so you see here the the echo of that in verse 7 you have domine and then uh deus omnipotence and then you have um yasta um Yudica tua um and it's interesting in the psalm it has um Judica tua so it's quite interesting going through this and um the psalm has righteous thou art verse 16 5 has thou art righteous 16 7 has true and righteous um psalm has O lord or jehovah uh, revelation has O lord which art most and shall be which means jehovah and the other one has lord god almighty uh and then um the psalm has an upright are thy judgments revelation has because thou hast judged thus and uh verse seven has true and righteous are thy judgments so it's quite interesting uh going through that and the connection between um psalm 137 so that was pointed out to me by luke carpenter and then the more i studied it the more i realized yeah that's it's very close in the latin and in the greek and um related to the name of jehovah okay so what else can i show you here um so i also did quite a fair bit of examining of the trinic declarations in the ethiopic because um stephen boyce in a debate against me said that the ethiopic um didn't match up it only had um like the one who was and will be it didn't have the the present or something like that so i went through every tritic declaration and so you can see this in this picture here where i've underlined lord and also underlined what they have for the one who wasn't is is to come and so you can see it's the same all the way through there um let's make that a bit smaller so i've got that too big i think whoops i've frozen my computer that's really good let's shut a few things down i've got so many things open Okay, so you can see that clearly um, with the Ethiopic. And when you look at the Ethiopic here, um, it's, the ending is a little bit different and it clearly has shall be instead of is to come. And so, um, yeah, basically, and he, he said the word Lord doesn't appear there. It says God. And so I went through, you know, one of the most known verses in, in uh, Matthew where it says Lord, Lord didn't we cast out demons you know, and it was exactly the same word so everything that he said about the ethiopic was wrong and so um i go through that and the the differences between uh the trident declarations here in the ethiopic 
So it's quite interesting uh, through Hoskia, through the Arabic. Um, I'm just trying to see if there's anything else that will be of interest, things I've already gone so far. Okay, well, I think that that would explain it. So if, if anyone has endured to the end, you've gotten my um, basic explanation of Revelation 16.5. And so obviously I've done a whole bunch of work into this. And for some people, this would be like me pulling out their fingernails. It would bore them to tears. For other people, they're very fascinated by this. Other people... Um, it's like they want to know about it, but they want it summarized. Um, at the end of the day, um, this is an issue that I know a lot about, um, and I would debate anyone in the world on this issue, on this topic. And um, yeah, I think um, I will easily, oops easily win i'm just checking to see who is on facebook there okay so i think uh, unless someone's going to join me and remember i'm only just going through these issues just sort of just to these are just platforms just to get people talking about the tr I mean, I can talk about debates. I can talk about any anything related to the TR. I can talk about Bart Ehrman. can talk about whoever you want. And so um, at the end of the day, <clears throat> excuse me, this is just a, a launching platform um, to, yeah, for discussion so that people want to chat. So kept pure in all ages, um, just said, made it to the end. What's the price? <laughs> Well, the prize is when you meet James White, you can school him and you can win and you can get that euphoric feeling of that you're better than James White, which is a really good feeling. So I've been there quite a lot lately. Um, so I'm pretty sure that that's Jeff Riddle, uh, kept pure in all ages, or maybe it's Christian um, Mc, McChaffrey. Um, so they've got a conference coming up. Maybe I should talk about that. So what was that text? And actually, yeah. uh, Christian here, but I have no meaningful apologetic. Yeah, that's the problem. I mean, I guess no one in the Reformation had a meaningful apologetic and um, I don't know how I I don't know how I, I lived in Pakistan for a year and I don't know how I had any apologetic there you know once they fi find out that you're a TR person it's like down the drain you know all your apologetics uh, just go down the drain and but if you talk about Erasmus and uh, Codex Montfortianus and you talk about all these things apparently that's how you win Muslims um, and you get them away from that nasty TR opinion and that's how you do apologetics apparently but I don't know which Bible to point them to because it's like you point them to Westcott and Hort then you point them to Nestle and you point them to the Nestle Nestle Island, then you point them to, you know, uh, other later editions based upon Bart Ehrman's work, and now we've got the Tyndale House text, and now all that's redundant because we've got the CBGM, 
and it's like you know i guess just bring all the bibles and all the translations and say there you go it's like bringing a scrabble puzzle and saying here you go the word of god's in there somewhere but um so i'm just trying to find this page actually i I had it on my Facebook where I shared text and translation. That's the one I'm looking for. Lots of good information on this site. Um, oh, yeah. I'm going to make this a normal size because I've usually got it so big that it's. Which TR? Answered by Edward Hills. <laughs> Classic. Yeah, I've got um, Hills' book just sitting right next to me. Um, very good. Wow, that's great. Very good. I'm really enjoying this site because I haven't gone through it and there's lots of information there. Um, Volunteers wanted. So if anyone wants to help build this website, contact um, Christian. Just go to this page, textandtranslation.org. There's heaps of material there. Why I preach from the received text. So you can pre-order it now. Um, you can receive a newsletter. It's just come up as a pop-up. Um, Dort, Westminster, and Johannine comma. Um, KJV marginal notes. That's interesting. Oh, wow. It's got them all. Yeah, I've got them all on my website, but um, very good. Yeah, that's great. That's in a really good order too. That's great. Well, it's got Word Magazine, um, Theodore Le Letus article, Bookshop, great. Very good. That's fantastic. So, um, so Christian, uh, I just want to ask you, did you understand what I said about um, Revelation 16.5 being in Nomina Sacra? And what, what would your thoughts be about that? Because um, I know I explained this to Jeff Riddle and Jeff sort of, he got, caught in the weeds of the KJV uh, today dot net um, website because I sort of said oh, I've read through that and I've gotten information from there but as you can see most of the information it uh, it comes down to a nomina sacra understanding of nomina sacra so I, I don't know if you're actually still there in the chat or whatever but um, if you um what do you think of that concept you, you know agree disagree think it's great think it's uh, good bad ugly or you're still undecided and what you know, need to do a bit more homework on that um what would your thoughts be on that that's if you're still there you've probably just gone off for a cup of coffee or something i guess in the uk it'd be pretty it'd be like, yeah it would be nighttime over there um wow great word magazine coming hanium there's so much information here so this would have to be um, probably one of the best sites on the internet at the moment to do with the tr so bookshop So I guess in answer to um, where is it? Excuse me, my coffee's gurgling down my throat there. In answer to this, who would you recommend reading? 
Um, yeah, well, I mean, I, I would start here. I mean, whether you want to spend the money on all these, you know, because um, some of these are critical text uh, positions, but if you want to successfully debate against um, issues that are, you know, that, that are popular today, I would recommend that, um, yeah, go through and pick a book and start debunking them or start, you know, learning from um, people like uh, Bergon and um, Hills and uh, Letus and, you know, these guys have all got very interesting things to say. Um, That's the problem with wearing these headphones. Like I've just swallowed some coffee and I'm getting like stomach gurgles and it's like, is that coming out like booming across Facebook and YouTube? Uh, yeah, so um, sorry, got a call, still half listening. Um, so yeah, I was just asking if, um, what do you think about the concept of Revelation 16.5 that I brought across? Uh, do you think it's, um, you know, it makes sense? Do you think it's warranted? Do you think there's something lacking there? Um, what would be your take on that? That um, the holy is on is is placed there in the manuscripts because it is showing that it is a sacred name and that the holy is part of a sacred name tradition, mostly from the Old Testament, that is put over shalt be or isomenos, and um, that Theodore Beza was correct in um, in changing that. Uh, um, yeah, just asking what your opinion is on what I've said since you've made it to the end and you got the prize. And um, yeah, so while you're thinking about that, I'll just show this. Um, <clears throat> this one here says um, 1 John 2 23. So this is Helge Evanson. Um, it would be an interesting TR reading for discussion. The AV 1611 has it in Roman letters. Um, but later KJV has it without italics, um, but some in italics, Scrivener and Beza, um, four and five include. Yeah, and so, um, yeah, so it's quite interesting that they put it in italics when Beza clearly has it there. I think, because I think one of the reasons for italics, because I know we, we usually listen to people like um, James White or Dan Wallace or Timothy Berg or Stephen Boyce, and and they emphatically tell you what the italics are there for. Um, when I went through the all the italics in the 1611 and matched it up with the, um, the 1900 Cambridge edition, I realized that there were so many italics that weren't in the original. Um, and a lot of them had been placed, um, a lot of italics had been placed in there, um, like in the Blaney edition. And so you might have a chapter which has, you know, say 10 italics in it, but then in the Blaney edition, it's got 20 italics in it per chapter. And so there was a lot of change. It was a lot of, difference and I guess um, standards had changed uh, uh, um, according to why they use italic, italics. See, sometimes italics are there for emphasis. Um, look at the name Hosanna. Um, actually, I'll, I'll look this up now. Um, Hosanna KJV. <clears throat> Okay, so if I can see the original 1611, yeah, or 21.9, I'm just hoping that this is the actual place where it has the italics. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. 
Okay, so. No, see the Hosanna there is not in italics, but there were other places where I've read it and it's in italics. Um, so I guess I'd have to go through all of those. It's, you know, it just becomes a study in itself. And especially when you're doing a live video, it can bore people to tears. Um, Anyway, I, I think <laughs> rather than me. Um, okay, so um, cool. No worries, Christian. Cheers. Thanks for joining us. Um, understandest thou what thou read? <laughs> no, just doing a Mark Ward there. Uh, fare thee well. Blessings, uh, as they say in the Christian say in Pakistan, Kuda Fes. Um, Twitter, it just means uh, God bless you. Um, okay, so yeah, when we're looking at italics, um, so yeah, Hosanna is emphasis. So it's like, um, and when I was going through uh, some of the marginal note concepts of um, Timothy Berg, I did a bunch of stuff on Facebook about this. Um, and he he'd written an article and so i went through every one of his complaints sort of to, to the point where I, I was like three quarters through the article and i was like man every single one of them is wrong you know where the marginal notes just become alternative readings they don't become oh this is what the the bishop's bible said or the geneva bible said or other older bibles said it's like no this is an alternative reading you know like the king james translators are all sitting around in doubt like oh it, it probably should say something else and they're all in doubt you know and that this is just used in debates and it's just this common concept that um yeah there, there's these alternative readings and so the thing is with I, italics um the italics in the original 1611 um, differ from what we have t today, uh, even to the point where I think some of the italics are very unnecessary. And like, like you were saying in um, uh, one John um, two twenty three, I'll actually I'll I'll get this up on my page here because I might have. A bunch of stuff written about it but i've forgotten i've done but the trinitarian bible society had announced maybe about 10 years ago that they were going to um print the bible without the italics so here we see i'll just make this large yeah so here we see the words actually appear in the text of Beza. Okay. Um, but they've put it in italics. I think they put it in italics because it didn't appear in the text of Scrivener. And I think that's the only reason why they put it in italics there, just so people know that, you know. So um, it could, could have been better with a marginal note saying, you know, this and that, but um, for whatever reason, they put it in italics. In the one that I've worked on, um, I haven't put it in italics because I don't th think it needs to be in italics. People believe it's the word of God. Uh, and so I think it's unnecessary to do that now. But back then when they were doing their work, I think it was, um, um, yeah, an, a necessary thing for them to point out that there was a change there. So we see in the 1565 text of Beza, it, it doesn't have that. It, it stops at Eki here. So um, the rest of the wording there um, is put in in his 1598. So you can clearly see that difference between those two. Uh, we look in the Complutense in Polyglot and it's it stops at the Eki. And so I've actually put that in red there. That's um, not usually in red. I've just gone in the early days. I used to go through and color these in. <laughs> how, how bored must you be, you know? Um, 
uh, the hexapla. Um, so yeah, the receptors has the footnote this, and so um, okay. So this is the how the sixteen eleven appears. Um, Whosoever denieth the son, the same hath not the father. But he that acknowledges the son hath the father also. Um, so whosoever denieth the son, so that's how it appears in Tyndale, uh, Coverdale. So yeah, it's 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 a very interesting topic, um, but I would definitely say that um, there's no need for italics there any longer. There is another italic. I think it actually is in one John where it has the love of God. Um, maybe I can find it. God. Must be that one. But yeah, it's clearly in the in the Greek, but but they've got it in italic, so it's actually a wrong italic. So that's where I'm like, okay, well the King James has all the correct wording, but you know, when it comes to yeah, you know, there might be um, you know, a comma or something like that. It's it's like, like my I think most of the commas, I, I don't think I've found commas in the wrong place or, um, you know, colons or semicolons in the wrong place or anything like that. But when it comes to uh, italics, I have found that some words were unnecessarily put in italics. Um, say, for example, in Matthew chapter 1, if you go to verse uh, 17, it has all the generations from Abraham to David are, so it's in italics, 14 generations. So they have the are three times in italics there um but in the original um 1611 that was not in italics so i'm pretty sure i actually chat about this a little bit here well maybe i don't no i don't maybe i've got a thing on italics nope but anyway, so the original, um, the original text there. Now I want to show you. Okay, we'll go to Matthew chapter one, verse eighteen. We'll start from there, or seventeen. You want to see the Bible? Where is it? We've got to go to the original sixteen eleven, Matthew. That'll do. Okay, so just to prove my point, okay, verse 17 from Abraham are 14 generations. So notice the R is not in italics. We also see. Um, in Matthew, I'm pretty sure it's one six. Maybe one five. I oh, no, sorry, it was one six. Where it has um, that had been the wife of Urias. Okay. <clears throat> um, I might have written about that here. Italics. Three extra italics appear here in Matthew 1 6 when comparing the 1611 to the post 1769 KJV editions. Um, yeah, so has that had been the wife, whereas the, the 1611 has only in italics that had been, not including the wife. And so um, you can see that there's a difference there. And so people um, who have come along later, they've seen that that uh, needed to be put in. I don't think it needed to be. Um, what I've done with my version is I've just copied the 1900, 
with italics and everything, even at times knowing that there are places where I probably wouldn't put italics. And one of the reasons I did that because I didn't want to create issue upon issue upon issue because I, I already do things like capitalization of deity and things like that. And um, I just thought, because I actually went through and I changed my whole entire New Testament to match the um, italics. And that's how I know that Hosanna, maybe it's on my site that I can search for it. Um, That's why I know that Hosanna um, is in italics. Okay. Oh, no, that's the wrong one. Hosanna. Mark eleven Uh huh. Found it. It was worth a look. Okay, so we see it down here. And went before, and they followed, crying, "Hosanna! Blessed is he that." So the Hosanna is for emphasis. <laughs> I was like, "Is Mark eleven nine? Okay, so let's just quickly go to eleven nine. Bible Hub. Let's go straight to the Greek. And if you want the text of Beza, but it's a little bit not good. Uh, additional parallel Greek. Okay. <clears throat> but we should be able to see whether it's in there or not, at least. Oh, we got Hosanna there. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. So that's pretty much these three are identical. So why is that in italics? Um, that's the question. <laughs> and so um, that type of thing, that's where I actually stopped following the italics in the 1611. So I was like, why has that, why is that name in italics? And it was like, it's like emphasis. That's the only thing, I, but they didn't do it in other places. So um, anyway, hopefully that brings a little bit of clarity on the italics. And so um, I've been going through for over three hours now, uh, unless someone else is going to join in like Stephen Avery or someone wants to have a chat, uh, I'm going to bail. But uh, we'll be here. Will I be here next Sunday? Um, I've got another debate coming up. Um, I think it's on the 25th, and so I've got heaps of debates coming up, which is really good. So um, I've been out there throwing out the uh, the fishing line and trying to catch a few people to debate me on these topics. Um, but, yeah, uh, hopefully this has interested you. Uh, hopefully it hasn't bored you to tears if you've already heard me go over Revelation 16.5 um, already. But I... I guess I gave you a bit of a skim through the book. If you want to know what I've written, you can just, um, I'll, I can email you the book. Just um, just uh, contact me and I'll send you that. Um, but apart from that, I think I'm going to split. Now, I'll just give it like an, another two minutes because sometimes Stephen Avery will just jump on board and then we're talking about all sorts of things. But um, if not, we'll just... Uh, Actually, what I'll quickly do is I'll go through the Pantocrator issue. So there was another issue with Revelation 16.5. Um, whoops. I might type it in pan. Oh. 
Actually, it's probably in Greek that I've got it written in, so that won't help. But what I discovered too was around the Trident Declaration is not only um, Jehovah, you know, it says Pantocrator. And so that would appear in actually verse uh, 7, where it has, um, yeah, Pantocrator. Yeah. So that seems to also be there around the Trident Declaration. So you have Trident Declaration, but you also have this Pantocrator thing happening which you know translates to and i heard the other out of the older say even so lord god almighty pentocrator true and righteous are thy judgments and so um yeah the pentocrator thing is is uh, quite interesting i can't remember where i put that information um i should really just copy say that go back here do a quick search Okay, it does appear. Yeah, so if we see here, okay, Re Revelation 1 4, we don't have the Jehovah or the Pantocrator, that's fine, because it's not a heavenly being saying it. Revelation 1 8, we have the Pantocrator. Um, then Revelation 4 8, we have the Pantocrator. And Revelation 11 7, we have the Pantocrator. Um, so yeah, quite interesting. So I, I think I've got to put a little bit more information on my website. I think I actually did a study on it, but I put it on Facebook. I didn't put it on my website. Um, but that's another thing I really need to look into. And yeah, so it has at 18, uh, 48, 11, 17, and then Revelation 16, verse 7, where it's the echo, uh, has the Pantocrator. So very interesting. Um, and this is where <clears throat> in Revelation 1, 8, where you see the word Theos. Okay, so you, this is quite an interesting thing where you have Curios Hotheos. Here you have Curie Hotheos. Um, and I'm guessing up the top here, yeah, it doesn't have Hotheos there, but that's probably in um, verse 7. Yeah, Curia Hotheos. So that's where I think that they've, they've looked at that and they've tried to copy that back into Revelation 1 8. They've gone, oh, the Curia, it, Curia is always preceded by Hotheos. So when we go to Revelation 1 8, um, we see that in some of the editions, like say the Complutensian, um, where is that? We have Hokurios, Hotheos. So they've added the Hotheos, saying that it was in the other um, Tritic declarations. And so um, this is the sort of study I'm doing into Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. And so. Um, me that makes sense i don't know <laughs> it makes sense to anyone else but um yeah well i've given enough time for someone to join if they want to join um that's fine what i might do next time is i might make a like a big announcement that i'm going to do a whole uh show like on a certain verse or a certain topic or um or maybe i could review something of you know mark ward or, or james white or or someone somewhere um and or maybe i could actually invite someone on the program and um that would be pretty cool someone willing to just have a chat so that would be really good all right so anyway i'm gonna bail thanks for joining us guys um and i'll see you uh yeah hopefully i'll be free next weekend and we can do this all again all right cheers guys thanks for joining